I've gotten records that sound absolutely incredible. You know, I mean, I've been fortunate to mix some of Joe Ciccarelli's tracks, and those just, like, mix themselves. I mean, you literally spend, like, two or three hours, and it's done. And then I've gotten records where it's just like, where did you put this microphone? You know, what did you do to this sound to make it this bad? And it's like... You can't just use the on-placement plug-in? I wish. I wish there was something like that. But, but then we'd all be bad engineers. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. You may already know that using true analog gear is one of the best ways to create a great record. Yet increasingly, we live in a digital world, recording and mixing inside the computer. So what if you could have the best of both worlds? Tegeler Audio Manufacturer is bridging the analog-digital divide by creating high-end analog gear like the Schwerkraft Maschine compressor and the Raumzeit Maschine reverb whose knobs you can control remotely using a plug-in in your DAW. Or their many analog units like the Cream Bus Compressor with Mastering EQ or the Very Tube Recording Channel that let you save your settings using a custom recall sheet plugin, offering a complete line of pro audio gear from compressors to EQs to reverbs and beyond. Now you can get a pro analog sound while benefiting from the power of digital. Let your DAW help you move your knobs so that your music can move you. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about Tegeler Audio Manufactor. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Ryan Hewitt, a Grammy-winning engineer, mixer, and producer with a credit list spanning all popular genres of music for artists like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, the Avett Brothers, Blink-182, Bob Dylan, and the Dixie Chicks, to name just a few. Relocating from Los Angeles to Nashville in 2015, Ryan took residence at the House of Blues Studios in Berry Hill and jumped into a nonstop string of records, including many Nashville and Southeastern artists. Ryan originally found his love for music and recording working alongside his dad, famed remote recording engineer David Hewitt, uh, whom with he traveled around the world recording live albums and providing broadcast audio for an incredible array of top artists. As a result, Ryan has spent his youth in small clubs, massive arenas, and every type of venue in between. From all these experiences, he developed a work ethic and preparedness that set him apart as a recording engineer, because on the road, there's only one chance to get it right. Ryan is also a great teacher and has videos on lynda.com, Pure Mix, UAD, Pensado's Place, and the Recording Academy. So I've put a bunch of these together into a YouTube playlist for you in the show notes, including many of his awesome records, which we're going to talk about today. And a reminder, if you want to see that, just click through in the show notes, um, and it'll take you right to the blog post where you can see the, the YouTube links. Please welcome Ryan Hewitt to Recording Studio Rockstars. Ryan, are you ready to rock? Always. Always, dude. <laughs> so very nice to meet you. Um, thanks for coming to the studio. It's a, again, it's a beautiful day outside, and uh, it's it's kind of hard to be inside in the studio <laughs> on a day like today. How, how often do you struggle with that? Do you ever feel conflicted about wanting to be outside on beautiful days and and wanting to also be in your you know dark control room? Well, dark moody studio. <laughs> uh, I, I can't be in a dark moody studio. I have fortunately I have skylights in my place. Oh, nice. So man. I can I can sort of see at least I can know that it's a nice day outside, even though I'm missing it. Uh, but yeah, I, I spent a year in a really dark studio, and and I had suffered from great depression, so I can't ever do that again. <laughs> Did you really? Just, yeah. So you had your vampire uh, chapter or whatever? Yeah, it was. It was a. It was a really. That was a tough year. 
having a, a dark studio in a place that was mismanaged and, you know, not, not, not so nice people there. Yeah. Uh, and as soon as I got out of there, I got much better. I did that too. Was that, <laughs> was that in Los Angeles? I mean, that not, was in LA. we're not, we're not looking for specifics, but yeah. that was in LA. Yeah. That was in LA before I moved to Nashville and, and actually was part of the impetus to move here. In fact, uh, cause it was so outrageously expensive to have a place of my own, uh, that I settled for this one that I found that was fairly affordable. In fact, it was, um, it was George Massenberg's old place in LA at this place oh, called really? the Complex. Ah. Uh, and the room was cool, but yeah, it was it was really dark and to the point where I had to bring in table lamps to like brighten things up even just a little bit. So it was uh You know, top shelf depression is kind of expensive. It, it's yeah. expensive. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but um no, I actually did that too. So it was um one of the first major label records I did. We were up in Madison, Wisconsin, which is beautiful. It's Smart Studios for oh, months. Oh, I love that place. Yeah. But the the nature of the music, the nature of our our daily work routine and everything was such that 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 we had the schedule that just started drifting toward the night, you know? Yeah. And then eventually we were, you know, showing up at the studio at three or four PM <laughs> and you work till like eight in the morning or something oh. like that and then go home and go sleep in the apartment. Yeah. And which had a pool and we were there in the summer, but of course I wasn't using the pool because I slept through the day. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, because I, I I love doing yard work and you know walking my dog and and going to the park and things like that. So if it's a beautiful day and I and I don't have anything pressing, I might show up late. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> you know? know, it's worth it. Um, I guess I'm always trying to strike a balance of that. It's I, tough. when you're excited to hit the studio, you're excited to hit the studio, and yeah. that's that. But there are those days where you know I just I really feel the pull of beautiful weather in Nashville's really offers some beautiful weather. Um, not every day of the year, but there are certain days where you're just like, man, it is really nice out right now. Yeah. And like, you know, that's the difference between LA and, and Nashville or, or one of the many differences isn't, you know, in LA, it's almost always nice. So you're like, oh, it's just another nice day. I'm just going to go to the studio and it's fine because tomorrow will be equally nice. Whereas here, you know, we just came out of a run of really cold, rainy weather and we've had this beautiful weekend and, you know, it's Monday comes around. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> You know, my dad's in town, so I'm like, ah, fuck it. Hey, let's go to the park. You know, let's let's yeah. go for a walk. Yeah, let's get outside and uh, and enjoy this weather. And of course, he's you know happy to oblige. Um, um, how much of making records could you do outside? Do you have a process where you just kind of have to listen to stuff and and could go for a walk and do that, or is there is there really no part of it that's hmm. that's useful? Uh, you know, outside of the studio. I haven't tried that to be perfectly honest. Um, I hate earbuds. So I don't um, have a pair. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, yeah, it's funny. I, I try. I leave. I'm. I don't know if anyone else is like this, but I leave my work in the studio. Like, you don't, I don't, you don't have earbuds. You just carry a giant jam box yeah, exactly. on your shoulder, old school, like old I, school that, New York. That would be funny. Um, <laughs> no, I, I I stay in the studio with my stuff, and and when I leave, I leave. You know, it's kind of weird like that. I don't well, even have a real stereo at home anymore. <laughs> there's a lot to be said for that too. I mean, you mm. know, the division of work and and play is yeah, that's a pretty good threshold to find when you're do doing this for a long time. Because yeah, like my life got better when I when I felt like I really understood that, you know, the start and stop of a work day. Yeah, I mean, I had a studio in my house. Like you know, I mean, I had a, a loft in Venice for seven years and I had a mix room downstairs that was barely separated from the upstairs. You know, I mean, certainly acoustically it wasn't at all. So, you know, when my girl moved in with me, uh, you know, I couldn't work late at night and, you know, she would, and it was like, you, you walk in the front door of my house and there's my mix room, you yeah, know, so totally. she would come home from work and you know, it's there I am. And it's, you know, we'd hang out and whatever. I'm just, damn, I'm not getting any work done. You know? So, uh, that's, I wound up actually moving out of there into that dungeon studio so it was You're like, this is so much better <laughs> for like the first five minutes I was there. And I, you know, I could get work done and it was great. I'd go to work and, and come home and the separation of it was nice, but you know, the going to that place was like super depressing. So it was just like, <laughs> if I saw you, it'd just be your face in the blue glow of a computer screen and a lava lamp. Pretty yeah, much. pretty much. Pretty Incense much. in the background. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah, exactly. Nice. And green, <laughs> like dark green walls and, you know. Yeah, it was, oh man. But it's in LA Ven near Venice Beach, so it's like all dried up smoothie cups <laughs> <laughs> up along the, the tabletop. Um, all right, well, so anyway, let's get back on track here. Tell us a little <laughs> more about, you know, how you got into all this. I know your your dad, you know, I've, I've shared your story through the intro here. Your dad is making records and, and, you know, you grew up around that. But give us a little more insight into 
what it was like to grow up around that stuff. And then, you know, at some point you sort of decided that this was something for you to do too. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Like when I was a kid, my father was always off on the road. He did all live recordings. So he had a remote truck, uh, one of the earliest, baddest remote trucks that, that was around uh, at Record Plant in New York City. So growing up, he was always on the road. And, and I didn't really understand that until I got into, until I started listening to music on my own. So so you guys um, were growing up, you were growing up in New York. Yeah, I grew up, uh, I was born in New York City, grew up in suburban New York. And uh, that's when my father's business started taking off. Uh, was like the early 80s when he uh, bought the truck from Record Plant and went out on his own. That's but cool. he'd be out in the mo- on the road for months with like U2 and Bruce Springsteen and the Rolling Stones and Neil Young and, you know, Pink Floyd, Frank Zappa, like everybody you That's could awesome. imagine. And like when you're a kid growing up in the 80s, you listen to music from the 70s because it's, you know, what your parents started listening to. So I discovered the Beatles and, and you know, and Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones and the police and things like that. And I'm like, whoa, what's this? You know, uh, got way into it. I had earbuds that, or, you know, headphones that right. I listened to on the bus to and from school and my, you know, hi-fi Walkman that my dad got me. And You're spinning live Frank Zappa records on a, on a um, Fisher Price. Yeah, practically. Turn, wind up but I would steal his tapes. Like he would, he would make cassettes of all these shows and, and have this archive in his office. And when he wasn't home, I'd steal them and make copies of them. And I'd, you know, listen to these live shows and his board mix off of his API console on the way to school. And Nice, and dude. Got... How are we going to convince you to upload those all for us <laughs> so we can all hear them? <laughs> Unfortunately, they're all gone. But, um, uh, you know, so I got into that. I started playing drums when I was, you know, 12 years old or whatever in the, in the high school or in the elementary school band, I guess. I started earlier than that, but got a drum kit when I was uh, 11 or 12, something like that. And, you know, moved to Pennsylvania after that, got into bands in, in junior high and high school, things like that. And um, went off to college at Tufts University. And my father insisted I get a real education. Um, right. But prior to that, you know, so in the the summers during high school, I'd go out on the road with him and, and be the assistant slash intern and, you know, runner, whatever, on, on a remote truck. So I'm like fetching coffee for people. I'm polishing the fuel tanks and wheels and you know, cleaning out the cab and all sorts of, you know, grunt work and stuff like that. Far worse than cleaning out toilets. So this thing looks like a tractor trailer <laughs> usually, right? It's a, yeah. it's a big, you know, motor yeah. engine with, you know, two seats up front, but then a and tractor then and, and like the back doors open, but you can kind of come in through the side as well. Or yeah, no? he had, his first truck, the, the record plant truck was like a, a straight truck. So it was like a 38 foot long, you know, one piece truck. And yeah, it had the big back doors with a lift gate and then a side door for clients to come in. And I mean, the old truck was, you know, it was straight up 70s, like wood paneling and felt, you know, felt acoustic treatments and things like that. Uh, he had a big pair of Westlake speakers with like two 15s on each side and a couple horns. It was fucking loud in there. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, it was cool. He had a, he had an API console from 1977 so cool. or 78 that's now actually at the House of Blues. And we just went to see that this morning together. Uh, and then when that one actually crashed in an ice storm, uh, on its way to a gig in New York city and, uh, he in the went, middle of a mix, uh, but no, I mean, he was like literally on the way to a, a gig at like six o'clock in the morning wow. and they had this big accident, totaled the truck. And, um, and then he wound up building a new one that took about a year and a half. And that was a tractor trailer. That was a, a much bigger truck with another API console in it and, you know, tons of outboard gear and tape machines and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, Fascinating. Um, wow. Yeah. But I used to go out with him on the road in the summers uh, during high school and then during college and, um, you know, got an education in electrical engineering uh, and actually really discovered recording and sound while I was in school for electrical engineering because I, I wound up taking over the school's um, PA company and, you know, getting all new equipment for them and really showing people how to like mix stuff. So my father had Given me some education this in, is in how Tufts? to mix at Tufts, yeah. So we, you know, we had like a Mackie console and all, you know, like the Mackie Eight Bus from the from the nineties. Love it. And I wound up getting a a DAT machine from my father, and he had like this portable DAT machine that, that I forced him to give me. And I started doing live to two track demos for all the bands on campus. And I don't know, do you know Guster? Remember, um, oh, yeah. Joe Pasapia yeah, was yeah, totally. it, was in yeah. Guster for a while. So I went to school with those guys. And I was doing front of house for them all the time. Nice. And on that on that little Mackie, remember there was like two stereo buses. So I'd hook oh, up. Yeah, totally. I so hook up the DAT player to the second stereo bus, and I would do a separate recording mix 
for the bands. And I'd be like, hey, you know, 50 bucks if you want this. <laughs> That's great. That's smart thinking, entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. You know? And then I'd have bands in like, you know, we had this storage space for all the gear and I'd, I'd bring bands in at like, you know, midnight to do like little demos and stuff. And that's actually where I really, really fell in love with with recording and learned how to use, you know, crappy compressors and stuff like that. Just seat of the pants um, mixing. And I still actually have some of those tapes, but I don't have a DAT machine anymore. Well, it's just an interesting thing, you know, too, that like it wasn't that it was cool and clever to create the second mix that made that work. It's the fact that people actually wanted a recording of themselves. You know, it's like, yeah. it, you know, if we just, just, just to go off on a little entrepreneurial tangent, it's that reminder that it, that successful little business ventures like that are all about whether you're providing a solution for an actual need. Right. Um, and that's probably at the core of, of making records professionally at any level, you know? Yeah. It's, it's very important to differentiate yourself and, and, uh, yeah, and, and give the client what they want. And it's funny that, like, you know, really that was a, a literal direct extension of you doing the the remote truck stuff. <laughs> it literally it was totally. it was a remote, a live recording. Yeah, yeah, and it was fun. I mean, I still have some of those bootlegs of Guster and, and some other campus bands. Uh, that's great. That's yeah. great. Well, maybe we'll get you to – we'll convince you to, to let us hear this. <laughs> so, um, all right, so you, you came to Nashville, and now you've got a studio over in um, uh, the uh, House of Blues – um, tell us again what House of Blues is and tell us about your studio. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, House of Blues is this big studio complex here, and we seem to have a lot of those in this town. Uh, Gary Bell's bought what was East Iris Studios over on East Iris Drive. Um, I think that was one of the last Tom Hidley rooms, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, and it was probably one of the, well, not the last, because there's always more. But it was a really, really expensive, well-built studio. Like the the walls between the control room and the live room are like six or seven feet thick. Wow! And I haven't seen that in a long, long time. You know, because you need sand. isolation. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't need... you don't want one sound bleeding onto no, another sound. Not not in an expensive studio. Um, not in a, in a in a big studio. They've got an SSLJ in there from the '90s, and you know that was like the console of that time period. Uh, and so there's two, there's two rooms in that building. And then, you know, he, he, uh, Gary Bell's the owner keeps buying up real estate around his main building. So he, Vance Powell used to be in the building across the street from my studio. Uh, and my studio is across the street from studio a, the big, the big room over at house of blues. Uh, and then behind my studio is studio D, which was an old shotgun shack from Memphis that when Gary shut down House of Blues Memphis due to no business there, he literally picked the building up, put it on a trailer, and brought it to Nashville. Wow. Uh, and my father's old API from the black truck is in that studio. What a cool thing that yeah. you know, he's creating this um, this whole compound of studios like that. Yeah. Um, I know as I drive through it, it's visibly evident because one of the the tricks that he's doing to um, to tie it all together is bringing painters to paint murals on all the walls and fences and everything. Yeah. So you feel like you're driving through this art exhibit, which is really cool. It's so cool, man. He's got this one guy, Scott. Um, I can't remember his last name, but wonderful artist and musician and painter. Um, yeah, and he's and they uh, Gary's put little picket fences up in front of every single building he owns, and they just paint you know artists on there. So they um, when they put up a new fence recently. I went over to Scott as he was, you know, putting the base coat on. And he, I was like, you know, so who are you painting this time? He's like, oh, yeah, I don't know. You got to talk to Gary. I'm like, I want, you know, Tom Petty had just passed at that time. Oh, yeah. I was like, you got to put Tom Petty on this one for me. And they did. And they, they awesome. put Tom Petty, they put Prince. Um, I can't remember. It's funny. I pass it every day. I can't remember who was, who's on my Is fence. Is Michael up there on the fence? Michael, <laughs> Jackson? Michael Jackson's on there somewhere. I think he's got the whole Jackson 5. Oh, um, nice. And then he's got the the whole Memphis rhythm section. Um uh, on on the wall behind my house, which is great. And, you know, all the blues legends, um, many of the country legends, you know, Johnny Cash is up there. The Beatles are up there. I was trying to get him to put Led Zeppelin, and for some reason he wouldn't do it. And I was like, dude, they recorded in Memphis. Come on. You, you, you can put them up there, and that that would be pretty cool. Yeah, no doubt. Um, there's more, there's hey, more there, room. You know, and uh, um, I guess it was Nick Worley when he was on here, he was talking about that too, and he said that the – uh, that he's seeing like, you know, tourists and people coming through and doing selfies in front Every of all day. this now, which is a kind of a pretty yeah. much a Nashville thing. And, you know, we live in a world of Instagram and selfies anyway. Yeah. But um, so I don't know whether I'll get be uh, thanked for this later or or uh, curse, my name curse, but rock stars 
Come on through Berry Hill. Get yourself a selfie in front of these oh, cool pictures. It's, it's, it's so pretty fun. Amazing. There's always there's there's like bachelor parties full of you know dudes and girls <laughs> that come over and take their pictures because oh we got Bob Marley is in my parking lot. So that's a really popular one. And Snoop Dogg's right next to him. All right, so maybe the studio for me to open up over there is <laughs> is the one where the tourists get to come in and cut a track, cut a cut a karaoke track. Yeah, you right. know, that, that's a very Nashville <laughs> thing too, right? In that, the that could be. That could be. <laughs> hey, talking about uh, fulfilling a need. Yeah. All right, cool. So um, I like to ask guests to kind of kick us off on the podcast with an inspirational quote. Anything that you feel like sharing? Getting us excited to hit the studio. Oh, one of my favorite. I got a few. Uh, One of them is uh, Richard Thompson, and he has this quote, and I'm I'm going to butcher it, but uh, he he has this saying. It's it's actually I think it's on my. God, it's on my MySpace. We already win for bringing up Richard Thompson on the. He's one of my heroes, man. I love that dude. He's phenomenal. Um, But he he has a quote, something to the effect of um, um, music is in the edges. And if you polish the edges off, you've got nothing. Ah, that's great. It's something to that effect. I think I actually have it on my Twitter page or, or Facebook or something. It's like, it's it, when I read that in an interview somewhere with him, it really struck me because, you know, we can sit here with Pro Tools and polish the edges of stuff all day long. And then you lose the vitality of the music you're creating. You know, if you're fixing everything, what's left? No, I think that's great. And I think that's an obvious place to take that. But the maybe the less obvious place uh, question that pops into my mind too is, can so, so the interpretation there is by overusing these tools that we have and these things that we can do to manipulate stuff, that, that the conclusion is that we will be removing the edges and therefore removing the music. But can we use all these tools to actually enhance the edges? Oh, yeah. So, so maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, what what pops into mind for you? I mean, for me, um, I mean, I like distortion a lot. Um, <laughs> sometimes too me much. Me too. Um, so, you know, you yeah, you can make things edgier. You can take, like, I'm, I'm working right now with, with a young girl who's got this beautiful voice. And there are certain songs on the record that are that are really nicely captured with a big tube condenser mic that, you know, sound big and full. And then some of them, I'm just like, man, this is just the wrong sound. So I'll put her on an SM5 and blow up the input stage to a tube preamp and then crush her with an 1176. And she's like, oh, I love that distortion. That's the coolest thing ever. And it's getting all ragged when she goes up high. And she's like, and, it, and I'm looking, you know, I'm looking in the rearview mirror because I, I, I sit, I, I cut vocals in the control room with her. And, you know, she... I don't want to look at her while she's singing and make her all self-conscious. So she's behind me. And on my desk, I have like a trucker mirror. Ah, that's cool, um, man. With a, you know, like one of those convex mirrors, I guess. And so I can see her, you know, subtly. And nobody really notices that it's there. And I can see her going like, mm, and like making these faces when things distort. And it's like inspiring the hell out of her. Do you think that she's looking at the back of your head and it's like inspiring emotional angst uh, for her? Or anything I hope like not. Because, <laughs> you know, that's one of those things that I... I or that I think anybody, when you get into the engineering stuff or producing, but particularly engineering, because in the world of computer screens, you're the one sitting closest to the computer and looking at it, is you you come to terms with the fact that most of the people you work with, a lot of the time, are looking at the back of your head all day long. You know? <laughs> I know. I'm glad. I mean, I don't really have a bald spot yet. Oh, I've totally got a bald spot. And right now I have long hair and, and I... I Sort of went for at one point and did the um, the the man bun thing, which is like <laughs> absurd on one level. But on the other thing, nobody ever tells you this. But what it what the man bun does is it covers your bald spot. Yeah, it's yeah. like a trick for kind of making that go away. It's from a trick it. or a beacon. Or to a say, beacon. hey man, I'm I'm really I'm really embarrassed by my bald spot. I have a certain it friend who's. Got a man bun to cover his bald spot. There's, and, uh, there's it's like, no dude, way around it. Man. You're just, you're just, you're really what you're doing is you're pulling the hair out of the front of your head, you know, <laughs> and relocating it. There's no way around it, man. We all just like we all adopt some level of the things we thought were ridiculous. At my some father point calls it life. migratory hair patterns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's uh, my next thing is to cut off the hair, cut off the beard, and just go back to a bu- shaved and a buzz cut. There you go. But we'll see. I'm I'm, I'm working this one for. A, I wouldn't for a recognize you if you did that. <laughs> it's been a few years. Yeah, it's freaky when people just suddenly get rid of you know their hair. <laughs> that's true. That's true. All right. So um, I think that's good. I, I love Richard Thompson's guitar playing. Fairport oh, Convention is one of my favorites. Um, what's the song? Is it uh, is it Red Red Rose or is it um, 
Uh, oh, I got to get it back in my head to share that one, but that's one of my favorite tunes. Oh, yeah, like, I just love that kind of British. I think it was um, his storytelling is unparalleled. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I, you know, I got to record him at my studio at Bonnaroo. He came through. Oh, cool. And he did needles and thread and and something else. And mm. and it was like instantly, I said, I was like, man, I'm really good at this acoustic guitar and vocal recording thing because <laughs> what's coming out of the, the headphones right now sounds really good. You can't fuck it up with that guy. Yeah. You know. And he he so two things about him. Um, he I met him. I was the mic wrangler on that that PBS show called uh, Sessions at West 54th Street. I don't know oh, if you've cool. ever seen that. Um, I think I remember that one. Um, did, it, was, did, it was in the 90s. Did Portishead play one of those? Portishead, I think, did one. Uh, I mean, there was tons of people came through. It was so fun. It was fun. a really good show. And you guys yeah. were using Cole's mics and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I mean, the engineer was Tom Cadley. He was the chief engineer at, at Sony at the time. Uh, he'd be a good guy to have on the show. Um and did you hear that, Tom? Did they, you hear that? They tried to do it as live as – well, they did do it as live as possible. No overdubs, no fixing, no tuning. And the the basis of the sound was a deck of tree hung over the stage. It didn't always work for acts like Beck or whatever. But, um, you know, with Richard, it was just him and a guitar. And I don't remember where I was going with the story. Oh, it was just an incredible performance, you know. And I and I got to meet him, you know, Mike, you know, plugging his guitar in, whatever. He had this some complicated DI, you know, internal miking system or whatever, Uh and I was just like, uh, hey, I don't mean to bother you, but I'm a really big fan, and it's really an honor to plug your guitar in. He's like, oh, oh, thanks a lot, thanks a lot. I was like, yeah, my dad turned me on to you when I was like 12 years old. And he's like, really? You know, so it became this thing. And then he did this other thing around just after that time where he uh, apparently Playboy magazine asked him to do like a uh, best, you know, top 10 or whatever of the millennia. I think it was, yeah, as, as he turned to 2000, um, you know, Y2K. And he took them literally and made and and did covers of songs from like 1100, you know, like old Celtic songs <laughs> and, you know, ancient European things up to, you know, some Bach and some, you know, popular music of the time. And they completely rejected his whole thing. But he's like, screw you guys, I'm going to make a record of this. And he went and did an album of like, you know, I think he put, you know, 15 or 20 songs on it. And it went from this, you know, ancient music uh, made by monks or whatever up to a cover of Britney Spears. That's great. And it, if you can find it, check it out. It's really, it's I'll really have to wild. Go check that out. I remember discovering Richard Thompson. So my good friend Chris King in St. Louis, singer in my band, he was an early discoverer of music, and he would turn me onto things. And I think we all have some version of that in our life, you know. Yeah. But um, you know, he turned me on to Richard Thompson about the same time he turned me on to Big Star, which oh, cool. all of which I discovered late. You know, me too. Nineties somewhere. Yep. And funny thing about both of those artists were. My first reaction in both cases was like, this is kind of messy, you know? And then, yeah. and I didn't get it immediately, but then I would experience that thing where like on the third listen, it clicks with you and it becomes your favorite record or your favorite artist yeah. from there on out. And that, that to me, that's the danger that I, that's the thing I struggle with the most is like, what do you fix? Where's the line? What's acceptable? What's cool? And what's just bad, <laughs> you know? Cause like, uh, when you think about like, the sound of indie records, you know, of like garage rock or whatever. It's like, is it shitty sounding because they intended to do that? Or did they just not know what they were doing? And is it cool because of which of those things? You know what yeah. I mean? And and some people, you know, like uh, some, some producers love for everything to be clean and tidy sounding and everything's got to have its place and you're going to play it a thousand times and get it right or I'm just going to edit this or whatever. And then there's other ones that are like, yeah, that felt good. Cool. Moving on. You know? And do you go back and tidy those little tiny things up or do you just let that ride? And it's, well, it's, it's a daily a, struggle for me. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a difficult question. Um, and hopefully we'll get into it here. We'll Let's jump into some questions about some of the records you've done because I think that's very sure. relevant. Okay. Um, let's see. The, the first two I was thinking about, well, particularly Red Hot Chili Peppers. When I listened to I'm With You... Um, one of the things that I noticed about that immediately is, is that it has, it captures high energy and it captures like the, all, all this attitude and kind of a punk rockness, <laughs> but it's very precise. Well, unfortunately I didn't really do that one. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. I thought uh, that was in, uh, in the discography, I, but I did, I engineered some vocals on it, but okay, um, cool. Greg Fiddleman, I think recorded that record and it sounds awesome. Well, so you did some work on that. Did I, you you, yeah, you had did, a little bit of experience working with vocals. Rick and but yeah, and I did through? I did Stadium Arcadium. I I 
engineered a lot of that and okay then, great, and then great. mixed most of it well yeah. same 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 same, same description thing. well what's interesting is that uh i'm with you was all pro tools that was their okay. first that was their first record on pro tools uh, and Stadium Arcadium was their last record on tape. So everything on Stadium Arcadium, except for the vocals, was done to tape, except okay. for Anthony's vocals. Okay, cool. Um, well, one thing I definitely remember about Stadium Arcadium, unless I'm mistaken, is that it really demonstrated or highlighted that Red Hot Chili Peppers thing with harmonies and background yeah. vocals and bringing all these, like this thing that at one point might have seemed too precious for a band like Red Hot Chili Peppers that brought it to the foreground and said, hey, "No, screw it. It's not too precious. We're going to yeah. feature this." Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was that was John's vision. That was John Frusciante's vision. Um, I think his first of all, John Frusciante is an absolute fucking genius. He is unreal. Like, if there's alien life, he's he's one of them. You know what I mean? He's he's from another planet. Tell us more about John. Uh, he well, I mean, this this is part of this whole thing where he just goes on trips about you know just down rabbit holes. Um, with different types of music. Like, he is absolutely obsessed with music. Um, and before... I'm trying to think of the chronology of all these things. It's it's kind of hard. It's hard to remember. Um, but he... I think before we did Stadium Arcadium... Yes, it was before we did Stadium Arcadium, he and I did a series of six records in six months. Um, nice. he, he called me up... Um, well, backing up slightly, a little bit further, I, the first time I met John was on um, that record, By the Way. I was the assistant on that with Jim Scott, engineering and mixing. Okay, cool. And Damn. after that record, Jim was hired to produce, mix, and engineer a solo record for John, which became, um, crap, what's the name of that record? Uh, I can see the cover. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, we'll, it, it'll come to me. Yeah, we'll come back to but it. But it was supposed to be like you know, two weeks to record, two weeks to overdub, two weeks to mix, you know, typical optimistic schedule. And yeah. it devolved. Plus, plus we like all these little catchphrases like that. Like when I go to Bonnaroo, it's like 40 bands in four days. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, there's this convenient schedule of blocks of time and it never works out that way. Uh, as optimistic as we may like to be, um, it turned into like two months of recording or it turned into like a month of basics and then like six weeks or two months of overdubs and then, you know, two weeks of mixing. And, you know, Jim was a, is a hot engineer. And so he booked all his time on either side of this, this session. And after the time ran out, he was like, look, I got to go and do this other record. Um, you know, why don't you take Ryan in the other room at, at what was cello now it's called East West um, and do all the overdubs. I'll be here if you need me to check in on anything, but Ryan's more than capable of engineering this stuff. And then when you're done, bring it, you know, let me know and I'll clear some time out and we'll mix it. And John's like, okay, cool. And I'm sitting there like, holy crap, I'm going to be engineering for like my guitar hero That's from awesome. when I was a kid. Um, so we wound up spending weeks and weeks engineering, you know, doing all these overdubs all to tape on a uh, Ampex ATR 124, which is the worst tape machine for punching in and out of. Um, nice. And then so, you know, fast forward a couple of years, he's ready you know, they, they did the touring cycle for, by the way, he comes back, he's written a million songs and he calls me up. I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, actually, no, that was a different phone call, but he calls me up. He's like, Hey, um, I want to record. I have like 50 or 60 songs I want to do. Um, I want to do like boil them down to like six albums. I want to do all these records. I want to do the exact opposite of, of the last, uh, Chili Peppers record, which took over a year to make. Um, I want to go in uh, we're going to be on 16 track tape. I want to record the entire record in five days and mix in one day. You know, are you in? And he's like, I want to do minimal miking on the drums, all the, you know, blah, 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 blah. He was on like a, a big, um, uh, he's just like on a big trip of 60s music at the time. I'm just That's like, true. absolutely. That sounds like a blast. And so we went in and we started this process and we'd record Monday through Friday and we mixed the entire record. No automation, no computers. 16 tracks That's the way and do, it man. was the coolest thing ever. And I'd never done anything like that before. I was having nightmares of like the tape machine not coming out of record and stuff like that while we were making this albums. Um, that so that, sounds super that cool. That turned into that. And then uh, he wanted me to do the Chili Peppers, right? The next one, the, uh, sta what became Stadium Arcadium, but uh, Rick- Which was up, the double album. It was right? a double album, yeah. Uh, Rick wound up hiring Mark Lynette to engineer the record. And uh, after a couple weeks- um, John called me. I was in the Home Depot at 10 o'clock at night, which you could do in LA because they're open 24 hours. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? I was like, oh, working on my house. He's like, I need you to come down. Um, 
these guys don't want to run the tape machine and they keep erasing my stuff. So I need you to come in and, and be the tape op. I'm like, okay. So I wound up being the tape op with Mark Lynette. And, and we then, then the first night I was there, we'd stay till four in the morning, just like doing punch-ins and fixes on all the songs they'd recorded already. Uh, and then I wound up taking over as engineer for the overdubs on that. Um, but yeah, all tape. And John we, did. We had 24 tracks at this point? We had 48. We were on, we're oh, on two, double, two, two tape, tape machines. machines yeah, two, together. two Studer oh, 800s. And, um, at least the Studer's kind of reliable. You could probably back yeah. it up and press play and it'll actually oh, do yeah, that yeah. for you. It was, it was ace. And, you know, we were running 30 IPS, so easy to punch in on those machines. And, you know, but we everything was to tape. The band played live in the room together. No click track. Um, and, you know, we do a bunch of takes and it's like, okay, well, the ver- try the verse from this, the chorus from this, maybe da-da-da-da. And I would do a test edit in Pro Tools. And then, um, because I was the tape that op, was- I, it was all my responsibility. So we'd, we'd do, you know, I'd, I'd do a quick, you know, quick mixes to the, to Pro Tools, do a test edit. Okay, yeah, that feels good. And then I would go in and the band would leave and I'd do all these That's two, so awesome. I had the edits. same experience, man, at, awesome. at, at uh, Sunset Sound. We were doing a record and the band really insisted on on using tape and I, I I believe we were syncing up tape machines too, but maybe not yeah. initially. But same thing, we would track everything into Pro Tools and tape simultaneously, mm. and then I do the edits on tape, and then go write down my my uh, time code numbers. Yeah, and just like zip around the tape, finding those. Oh all yeah, because I would pre-stripe the tapes with time code. Yeah, the same same kind of thing. And when we when we did those mixes into Pro Tools. Um, my little thing that I actually developed during the Blink One Eighty Two record was I would I would record um, the Simpty track into Pro Tools and do the do the edit the test edits in Pro Tools and then I could feed that into a timecode reader and I would know where all my edits were and what reels they were on and stuff yeah, like yeah. that because I would have like reel one would be one hour you know it would start at one hour reel two would start at two hours and so on so you I know, knew exactly it's where it's funny the you said were. like when the band leaves because that was another part of that equation. That's one of those engineering moments where you're like, I, I got to put like earmuffs on and block the world out yes. and go into like maximum concentration and not screw this up. Oh, yeah. I mean, my first tape edit was on one of John's solo. That 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 first thing that Jim Scott gave me, I can't, I can't I'm so angry. I can't remember the name of it. But um, it'll come to you. That record that we were doing. Don't want, look directly at it. It's like stars. Yeah. It's like the, the, the dimmest <laughs> star in the sky. Just don't look at it. Yeah. Uh, but we were working on a song and he's like, He's like, you know, he's playing a solo on it or whatever. He's like, shit, we didn't play this long enough. I need like another eight bars or 16 bars or whatever it was. He's like, you know, so we're listening to the solo section without the solo. He's like, all right, this section here, can you loop those four bars? I'm like, sure. And I'm like, um, you know, and, and he's like, how long do you need? I'm like, oh, about an hour. He's like, cool, I'll be in the lounge. And so I'm looking at my assistant and I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do now? <laughs> so like. We copied that those four bars onto another machine twice because we needed to loop it twice, and I cut those together, made made that eight bars, and then I cut that into the master tape, and that was the like I had never edited two inch before. I'd done half inch edits and stuff like that for Matt. For did um, you learn pretty mixes. quickly that you need to have a sharp razor blade? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I, I'd learned by watching Jim because you know when we did that um, by the way record, he was making edits all over the place. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was just like holding my breath as I'm cutting this tape. And it's like, holy crap, I'm cutting John Frusciante's record apart. All right, here we go. <laughs> so a couple of the things that happened to me when I was doing the the tape edits um, at Sunset Sound is that I was feeling very clever about myself. So <laughs> I made print out pieces of paper that had like, you know, that I could write down all these edit points and then like methodically go through the song. And I think we were mostly editing drums with some bass and it like, it was kind of silly to the point where like we didn't need to, we could have skipped the whole thing and just recorded it into Pro Tools. <laughs> but it was like, we get to the end and I'd have a, um, the song might have like 30 edits in it or something like that to just kind of cut the drums together into yeah. something usable. <laughs> um, but another funny thing we did was before we started, the band, like we knew we wanted to use tape, but we really didn't know, know well, what tape format should we use and what speed should we use and what alignment settings should we use? So I was like, I looked at it, I was like, well, why don't we just align like six channels, six different ways, and then we can run the tape on it at 30 and then at 15, and then like just kind of listen to it back and decide. It's kind of a great idea. It, you know, it worked. I mean, why we not? narrowed it down, but I mean, what a way to waste a lot of money too. That was you know, back when we were spending label that was, money. Yeah, those were the days. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but but yeah. we ended up, you know, we ended up deciding, I think it was like 456 at 15 ips. I prefer low bias tape. Uh 
and and 15 IPS myself. I, I think I print a lot of my mixes. I have actually one of my dad's old Studer 810s that I print my mixes to. Quarter inch, 15 IPS on a CCIR curve. I think I'm at plus three. And I, I you know, I don't, I don't like bury the needles, but I right. hit it pretty hard. Well, there you go, rock stars. You may not have a tape machine in front of you, but <laughs> I bet you've got a tape machine plug-in that can yeah. let you get close to some of those you know, settings. And it, it's interesting because I, I remember having an argument with an engineer that I was assisting in... 1998, it was Greg Rubin. We were working on a Harry Connick Jr. record and we were printing the mixes. I convinced him to print half inch 15 IPS with Dolby SR because it was a jazz record, you know, and and you needed it to be clean. And he's like, oh man, you know, pretty soon we're going to have emulations of this in the computer. I was like, no way, dude, that's way too complicated. We're no way we're ever going to have that. <laughs> and here we are 20 years later, literally. Uh, and we have, I can't even tell you how many tape saturation emulators I have on there. Um, it's yeah. crazy. And like the UAD one with that, with that ATR 102, you can change all the, pl all the, um, alignment, alignment parameters right? yeah. and they have a video, I think on how to do all that stuff. And it's funny, I was trying to align it at one point, like I was putting tone into it, trying to do it like a real <laughs> tape machine and I completely <laughs> fucked the whole thing up. And then you get halfway through and you're like, wait a minute, this yeah. sucks. This, this I didn't terrible. want to have to align the tape machine. No, but then there's all the presets. So you just click through those and whatever sounds good. I mean, eventually we'll get like, for the ultimate le level of legitimacy and plugins, we'll actually put in all the stuff that breaks about analog gear. So well, you're constantly having stuff like mess up on you in the middle of a session, yes. tear your hair out. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, the, that's one of the things I love about some of these new UA plugins is that they have that little headroom knob. And you can really mess with the sound with that. You know, you can, you can distort things in a, in a nonlinear fashion. Nice. And I really like that. I think like on non linear. The a, yeah. And like on their like API 2500, there's the headroom knob and on the new Fairchild compressors, I think. So you can make it so that it doesn't distort or so that it distorts and clips earlier. Just use your ears. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really fun. Um, all right. So let's jump to another band, Flogging Molly. Oh yeah. Tell us about working with those guys. I feel like when I listen to some of their music, <laughs> it, again, it's got a great live energy, but it's super tight. And I wonder if you could talk about, um, mm. which was similar to the question I was asking about uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers is like, and this don't polish the edges off. Like what, what does that mean to try and capture live energy and have things super tight, but not Maybe not too perfect. Well, it's interesting because because when you go see a band live, it's it's a um, it's it's a you're experiencing it in many senses. You're seeing it, you're hearing it, you're feeling it, you're smelling the bar you're in. You know, it's act like a live performance activates all your senses. And when you listen to a record, there's only hearing. You know, you're not seeing anything. You're not. You, you maybe you're feeling it if you got a subwoofer going or you're listening really loud. Um, and you have a beverage in your hand, you know, maybe there you're might be altering. some hot girls around. Yeah. Too, I yeah. mean, who knows? But, but if you're listening to a record, it, it you know, or, or I guess hot guys, if you're a girl, hey, you know, it's whatever floats your boat. Um, but like with, with Flogging Molly, I remember, um, I'd actually never heard of them before they called me to do their record. And in fact, they called my old manager looking for someone else to do it and he didn't want to do it. And so they're like, well, you should use Ryan. And so I immersed myself in their music and went to see them live and, you know, heard the records that they had done with Steve, Al Steve Albini, um, which to me were unlistenable because it's like, all right, here's this like mediocre punk rock band in the studio with a producer who's not going to tell them to play it again. And I love Steve Albini. Believe me, I love a lot of the work he's done, but he's not the guy who's going to give you any feedback. He's the right. non-producer. So for you, that didn't feel the, like the the best way to create a record for those guys. Well, I mean, it was a document or, or of where they were at the time. What you would do? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because prior to doing, just prior to doing that Flogging Molly record, I had done the Chili Peppers with Rick, who is a freewheeling vibe guy, no click track with incredible musicians, you know? So there's there's that experience of the, you know, uh, on tape, it is what it is, you know, play it again if it's not great, edit the pieces together and and make something awesome. But like, you're talking about three of the greatest musicians in rock. And, you know, it's like, I don't care if you like their songs or are offended by Anthony's singing. Um, those three guys are unreal. And when they hook up, it's just like, you get goosebumps like you wouldn't believe in the studio listening to those guys yeah. off the floor. And prior to that, I was working with Jerry Finn, God rest his soul, on the Blink-182 record. And he was the opposite. It was like, click track, everything perfect, make it great. But we weren't, you know, it was all on tape still with, with Blink. So it was do it again, do it again, do it again, great. Okay, double track the guitar. 
No, it's out on that one bar. Punch that one bar. Fix that. That note is out of tune. Fix that. Um, so I had this dichotomy in my brain of like, here's a record where everything's perfect and high fidelity, and here's a record that's that's all vibe and you know and and goodness and gushiness and edginess. Like so, like Animal House when he's got the devil and the angel on his shoulder. <laughs> totally. I mean that that's sort of again that's my struggle is I have these these two mentors in me of Rick Rubin and Jerry Finn, and it's like. Who, what's the appropriate path here? So with with Floggy Molly, um, you know, I sort of, I was taking, I was trying to find my route as, as Ryan Hewitt, producer, engineer, and mixer. And that was really the first sort of big thing I got to produce. So we went in a studio in, in Ireland. Um, we had a week of pre-production time, just rehearsals, working out songs. Are you working with Ted Hutt on this record? Too? No, I was producing. I was okay, I right. was in charge of everything because okay. they had, they had worked with Ted and and he was in the band at one point. Um, and they you know they had whatever experience they had with him and were ready for something new. Uh, and so we went yeah we went over to Ireland, camped out in this holiday park off season, um, and rehearsed in this little cottage for a week before going in the studio. And and now is the cottage made out of uh, big round stones? Oh, no, it? this was just like this this hokey, like holiday retreat kind of thing with a series of little, okay. you know, <laughs> cottages around like a little shitty restaurant and whatever. You're not using a live sheep for a pillow oh, or no, no, anything no, like no. that? Oh, no, 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 no. We were using mattresses from everybody's bedroom to try to soundproof it, but it was totally useless. But we rehearsed there, and then we went to this beautiful studio called Grouse Lodge in, in Limerick, Ireland. Um, in this, like, this old stone barn that must have been from like the 1600s or something like that. They that this crazy guy turned into a studio, and um, you know I I was like, all right, cool, let's try to do this live. And then I realized like, all right, well that's not the greatest way to do this. So all right, let's have the rhythm section cut it live. Okay, great, this is doable. So we'd cut the cut the rhythm section live. I would do any fixes that we needed to do, and basically the mission was a song a day. So we come in in the morning ish, eleven noon whatever. And um, get the whole band in there, make sure the arrangements were right, kick the ins, we call them the ins, so like the mandolin, violin, accordion. <laughs> we'd, you know, make sure everyone was cool, and then we'd kick them out and focus on the rhythm section. So, you know, guitar, bass, drums, and maybe the acoustic guitar with Dave King. Um, and we'd have a take within an hour or two. I'd fix up anything I needed to fix up, just, you know, tighten anything up that got a little wonky, or we'd punch in fills or fix a guitar part you know, maybe double track the guitars and then bring everybody else in, pile all the overtubs on. And then by 10 o'clock at night, we're ready to sing. And so Dave and I would be in the, in the room and we'd sing it and, and, uh, you know, I'd comp it up, fix it up. Okay, cool. I think we, yeah, we got a vocal. Great. And then everyone would get drunk. <laughs> okay. I was just about to ask if, if vocals included, like involved, you know, whiskey or, or anything like that. If that was Dave a part was not of allowed lab. to drink whiskey during the record. Okay. Right. Um, but, but the, the, Bought the the restaurant or the the studio. What word am I looking for? The studio had their own bar, so it was on the honor system. And uh, we went through. We were there fourteen days. We drank seven kegs of Guinness, uh, eighty two bottles of wine, and twenty six bottles of whiskey. Wow! So you weren't fucking around. <laughs> no, no. There's actually a photo somewhere of there's seven people in the band, and they were each standing on an empty keg. At wow. the end of the record. And one of the guys didn't even drink. So it was six guys in the band, me, the assistant, the studio owner, and the tour manager. So it was like 10 of us. And um, yeah. How'd you feel at the end of that? Because I mean, I know Fat. what the, a little bit that's <laughs> like. It's like you've got this combination that, that the process of being creative for a couple of weeks and making a record can be super invigorating, yet that's, you know countered against maybe not mm. eating your best or something for that time. Or I was not eating my best and and... Yeah, we were drinking a lot. I remember my assistant, my friend Owen Lewis, he lives in town, actually. He lives here in Nashville now, um, was my assistant. And he would bring in trays of of pints, you know. It was it was just completely obscene. I was ex absolutely exhausted when I flew home. Yeah. So you don't go straight wasted. from a record like that to the next record. You got to take a break well, in the middle. Well, I went home and uh And then John Frashani listened, called you up again? and. Uh, Oh, the, I'm trying to get the chronology of that. And, um, I, yeah, actually, I wound up doing another record with John. But yeah, I got home and then I, I sat in my in my second bedroom with a Pro Tools rig and cleaned everything up, fixed all the you know errors and and you know things to make it um, a great record, and then went and mixed it on an Eve. And uh, I was, I'm really proud of that record. I think it came out well. Well, it's true that that sort of process of post production does go well with like not kind of getting out of your. Uh your your boxers and your t-shirt and just like sitting around yeah. the house all day drinking too much coffee and just kind of yeah. chilling. 
It's it's an interesting, you know, it's it's kind of a crazy way to make a record. I was literally, I was so exhausted when I got home, but um, it it came out really good, and everybody was happy. It went number four on the charts, which they have not matched since. So nicely done, man. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> All right, so um, let's let's stay on acoustic instruments for a middle for a minute. Yeah. Uh, the Avett Brothers. That's another band you've worked with. Oh, um, yeah. What, I wanted to ask you what kind of stuff you've learned about recording things like. Uh, piano, banjo, and all the ins, you know, in, in your experience and how, how um, you know, do you have any tips for us about that kind of stuff? Don't be too precious. Um, every, it's funny because I do get a lot of compliments on the Avid Brothers records and, and I'm proud of them. Uh, almost all the acoustic guitars are SM57s. Nice. So everyone's like, oh, what'd you use in that? It sounds awesome. I was like, dude, it's a 57. It's <laughs> like, like it's why ready did, to go. Why did you use that? I'm like, because it sounded good. And I always, you know, pre-mixed. I always forget to do that again. I honestly, I always, I'm always trying to get like something high fidelity or whatever. And it's just like, just put a damn 57 on it, man. And, you know, I mean, yes, I was putting it through Neve preamps. So yeah, sure, that helps. And somebody but, played it well, that helps too. Yeah, you know, they're, they're good players, but, you know, they didn't have like the greatest instruments or anything like that. It's just a vibe, you know. It, a lot of the I Am Love and You record was the three of them playing together um, in the room, all looking at each other and and just going for it. You know, and I feel like there's a, a quality to that stuff where it sounds uh, unified and yeah. probably choosing a mic like that helps to unify it sonically, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I can't remember who was making a joke like, oh, let's make a record with all 57s. I'm like, I've done it. It's the Avid Brothers. You know, it's like they had 50, SM7s on their vocals, 57s on the on the guitars, and like you know, 57s all over the drums. Things like you know, variants of of that. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, don't don't be too precious. I mean, you know, everyone's like trying three or four or five different microphones on an acoustic guitar. It's like if it's only acoustic guitar on on a record, okay, sure, I'll get I'll put multiple mics on it, but. Um, you know, there's a million ways to skin a cat. Someone just told me the other day about how Glenn Johns would put a 47 right up against the, is it the bout of a guitar, like behind the bridge? Apparently okay. his thing is putting it like two inches from the wood behind the bridge and then telling the guitar player, don't move and remember exactly where it is. Like figure out how many fingers are between your guitar and the, and the mic or whatever. And I'm like, I would never in a million years have thought to do that. Um, and then, you know... Which part? To put the mic there or to, to put tell the mic somebody that not close. move? To, well, I mean, I tell them, I always, I, I make, I spike the feet of the acoustic guitar player when we're recording so they know What does where, that mean? What is, what is it to I put a piece of tape. Uh, it's a live term. Like you put a piece of tape on the floor to tell someone where they're supposed to be. So like when an actor is on stage doing a, a play or whatever, they'll oftentimes put a little piece of tape down there so they'll, they'll spike their, their position so that they know walk out to precisely here when they're going to deliver this part of the So the uh, guitar player, acoustic player, maybe is, is you've got a mic up there playing acoustic. You mm-hmm. go out and you put just a piece of tape down there or you sort of like put the little outline, like uh, like a police outline crime scene of their foot. It, uh, I, I generally just put like a little piece of tape in front of each of their, you know, like the big toe of their feet, you know, and say, this is where you're supposed to, to be and you know, you know if you created a it. holographic image on a on a glass <laughs> plate of them sitting in that position that you could get them to line up perfectly and yeah like, but it, it still wouldn't matter because the humidity <laughs> will be different and the power you know the, the voltage coming out of the wall will be different and something will change you know but I do have a book upstairs about how to make your own holograph so if you ever oh, want to go that road no I'm too dumb for that all right so um, <laughs> what about um, the uh, the drums sounded great on the Avett Brothers too and what would you like to say about ch- recording sort of an acoustic-ish band with drums, trying to get that live, everybody's playing together, but make sure the sound is great too. I mean, can you put the drums where the acoustic instruments are? Is that really hard to do? What what tips do you have for that? I prefer to have the drums isolated from acoustic instruments, um, especially working with Rick Rubin, who will change his mind about anything at any moment. Um, and you may have to fly something from here to there and, you know, uh, edit something in a crazy way to satisfy what he's looking for. So I try to isolate things as much as possible um, on a on a quote unquote popular record, um, and be able to have my options. Um, if I'm working with a band that's very decisive and skilled, then I have no problem having bleed. But drums in an acoustic guitar that would be a total drag. Um, I actually had to mix a record where there was more drums in the piano mic than there were pi- than there was piano, and that that limits your you know, from a, a pleasure standpoint, from a listening pleasure standpoint, it, it limits where you can, how far outside the stereo image you can pan things. Because like, 
if you pan, if you want to have this piano pan to the right and there's more drum bleed in it than there is piano, like all of a sudden you have this really lopsided and irritating, you know, stereo image. So you got to sort of put it center. And all and, my records are lopsided that. and irritating. <laughs> so, so are my, I mean, mine wind up being, cause it's like, that's just the way life is. Um, yes. I mean, that's cool. And I, I feel like I, one of the first things that I stumbled on with my band was, was, uh, having the drums and then the acoustic guitar was sort of across the room and it was a nice wooden room. And, and it, in that instance, it did kind of work. And it was like, I was like, oh, wow, that makes a great room mic for the drums. Sure. But you have to like really commit to that. And it's like, that's the thing. And you yes. want to get that, that panning right at yep. the get go. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that can be fun. But I mean, for me, it's, you know, again, like having worked for Rick Rubin for so long, it's like, I have to be able to have, you know, ultimate flexibility to, to move things around and manipulate yeah, things totally, totally. at a later date. Um, yeah. I, and I imagine that partly you already knew that you needed to be ready for a bunch of things, but on the other hand, um, do you have any good stories you want to share about like, uh, having to apologize that you can't do something on a session like that? Uh, whether that one or any, any session? I'm trying to think. I mean, I, my philosophy is to try to always say yes. And if it doesn't work or if there's a limitation, be like, okay, yes, but here's the, here's the thing. Uh, so, um, I don't know if I've like ever- Like Scotty from the engine room, you say, yes, it'll take two weeks, captain. Yeah. Yeah. Then... Uh, well, I mean, I've had to say no to Rick. Like he's, he's at like, oh, let's do that. I'm like, well, actually we can't do that. Cause you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's but, cool for me to make that a click to tweet. Ryan Hewitt, I've had to say no to Rick Rubin. Well, no Just is a powerful <laughs> word. No, it's it's fantastic. No is a very powerful word. And, you know, I've, I've I had a, a circumstance where, you know, Rick's like, well, you know, I, uh, I can't, we were working on an Avid Brothers record and I would go up to his house and play him rough mixes from the record we were cutting in North Carolina. And he's just like, all right, you know, this, 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 and give me like a, you know, we'd, we'd have a list of all this stuff to do. Like, you know, try doing this, try doing this, 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 this. So 20 songs, like edits and rough mixes. Whatever. Cool. So can you come back tomorrow? I'm like, no, this is like four or five days worth of stuff, man. He's like, all right, cool. Uh, call me and just come up on Friday. Great. Fine. But if you say yes, he expects you to be there tomorrow. Right. And if you say, yes, I can do this in five seconds, you know, people are going to expect that. And if you say, actually, no, it's going to take me five hours. Okay, cool. You're managing expectations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it happened to another engineer who worked for Rick and he was like, yeah, I can do that. And he got home realizing like, wait, no, I can't do that. And I'm like, dude, just say no. What's he going to do? You're the guy making the record. He's the guy sitting on his couch waiting for you to come and bring the record to him. He's going to be there on Friday. You it's grew not, up in the eighties, man. Just say deal. no made sense to you, you know? <laughs> it, it sort of did, you know? All right, dig it. Um, let me see. I'll ask one more question here, and then we'll take a break for the uh, jam session and come back, back in with oh lots more questions. All right. But um, uh, Whitey Morgan was another uh, artist you had worked with on your on your credit list. Yeah. And I noticed he had sort of that deep country vocal tone. Mm. And here you are in Nashville. You've been here for a minute. What tips can you share with us about recording and mixing a really great deep country vocal? I can't even do it. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's a big dude with a big voice, and um, we. It's funny his manager. Coffee maker closing down in the background. There. <laughs> he's, there's always something making noise, but his manager is a really astute guy. Um, he was brought up by his father-in-law, Punch Andrews, an old friend of my dad's. He'll may, ask him to tell you some stories about Punch Andrews tomorrow. Uh, manages Bob Seger, um, nice. and anyway, he he has a really good set of ears, um, and. You know, we got to this studio. He's like, all right, well, you know, we got to have a 47 on his voice. I'm like, well, we can try that. But I have this this other mic that I think is going to be better. He's like, oh, well, you know, we got to try the 47 and a 251, and then we can try your mic. I was like, fine. So we put up the 47 and the 251 and we put up my mic. Um, and he tries the 47. It's like, wow, that sounds, you know, big and exciting. And then we try the 251. That's ah, too bright. And then we try my mic. And he just sings one line. He's like, that sounds like me in the headphones. I'm like, fuck yeah, it does. And he's like, cool, let's go with that. Uh, and you know, I turn around to the manager. I'm like, "You happy now?" He's like, "Man, that sounds great." All right, cool. Um, and uh, yeah, we cut we cut the rest of the record with that. It was it was an SM5. Cool. Some, some what you friends, mentioned already. Some of my friends are going to be really upset that I mentioned. Tell us that. what's the difference between an SM5 and an SM7. Uh, the SM5, from what I gather, it used to be it was originally intended to be a boom mic for film sound. So it's got this big, you know, huge windscreen on it that fortunately comes off. 
But I think it's just another variation of an SM57 capsule. Um, it's got no transformer in it, uh, so it's pretty low output. And the SM7 has a transformer in it, and it's got like some roll-off switches and stuff like that on an SM7, like a, a presence boost and a, and a low yeah, cut filter. Yeah. SM5 has nothing on it. It's ugly. Um, and it's got this big suspension mount on it that's really ugly and annoying looking and breaks all the time. Um, but it sounds awesome. Is this sort of a long SM57 shape? Mm, there, it's just literally, it's like a capsule suspended in this big, you know, shock mount thing. Oh, okay, cool. Um, oh. But the capsule itself looks like an SM57, and I don't know what the difference is. It sounds awesome on acoustic guitar. It sounds great on vocals. Um, and yeah, it just, it captured the bottom end of his voice. But a big part of of capturing a big, deep voice like that, to me, is actually mic position. And because uh, you're you could be battling proximity effect, which is like kind of false low end, um, which works great with someone on a thin voice. You want to get them up close to the mic and and get that bottom end reinforcement. But I found that you know being uh, you know six inches away from well with an SM5 you want to be right up on it with a dynamic mic. You know being close is is good. And with the Avits, you know I would always tell them like. You know, they, they had big beards at the time. I'm like, dude, beard on beard, get your beard right up on that microphone beard. <laughs> and, um, and they're, you know, so we called it, you know, there's beard on beard action going on in the studio. It was pretty silly. <laughs> um, and, you know, and they would back off and it get really thin. And those guys have really reedy voices as, as it is. They have really big pres like a huge spike at like 2.5K or something. It's really irritating. Um, but Whitey didn't have that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, he could get close to the mic and, and back off when he's getting loud. And it, and it got this really nice chest resonance. But if you're going for, uh, you know, like a big clean sound, like a Johnny Cash kind of clean sound, you know, pointing it down, pointing, pointing a large capsule condenser down at the chest will, will get you a lot more bottom end. And, and moving that mic, angling the mic a bit will really change the response of it. And you can help, like, you can help with S's by moving the mic and getting it out of the, the path of their whistle, um, so that, that's a, a thing to experiment with. Yeah. I've experienced, singers. um, times where I have a vocalist on the mic and something just sounds laser beamy about it yeah. in, in the speakers and it annoys me. And I might ask them to just, just sing slightly off mic. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's almost like a mental shift. If they, if they imagine that they're a laser beam and they're not focusing it right at the capsule or, but slightly off, yeah, that can make a difference too. Totally. Like if, yeah, if you get someone with a really reedy voice um, or a spiky kind of voice, which, you know, in the room, it might not sound like that, but yeah, if you have a laser pointing at this gigantic membrane, it's going to catch all that, you know, laser focused energy. It's a good point. Lasers. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, we'll take a break now. We'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstars, I want to remind you that we're going to have links to the stuff we're talking about in the show notes, just go click through on your mobile device or go to the uh, the blog post at rsrockstars.com. Use the magnifying glass, search for Ryan Hewitt, it'll take you right to it. And um, <laughs> we'll, I'll have the YouTube playlist as well with his his music and his great teaching videos. you got lots of great teaching stuff. Oh, they're too. so much fun. Um, and uh, also just a, a shout out to you uh, and aside, if you're learning more about mixing yourself and you want to take my free mix training course, just go to mixmasterbundle.com and I'll, I'll show you how to mix using free plugins in any DAW. So go check that out as well. We'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Supa Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more 
audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Ryan Hewitt, and we're going to jump in, ask some more cool questions about making records, and then kind of uh, make our way out through the usual jam questions. Ryan, are you ready to jam? Let's do it. All right, so... Um, Let's talk about another band you worked with, the Lumineers. Mm. Um, great guys. I've had them into my studio at Bonnaroo as well. Talented musicians. The the records that I listen to have some great reverbs on them. And I wanted to ask you, um, how do you go about discovering the best reverb or effect for a record if it's going to be kind of a big deal? Um, and can you share any stories about the Lumineers? And, and with regards to the reverb, um, are there some cool tricks for also making reverb more interesting than just like pulling up a reverb plugin and choosing one of them? Oh yeah. Well, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, the <laughs> go with run with any of them. <laughs> well, it's funny because I used to hate reverb, um, and I still do to an effect or to to an extent because it is very frustrating to get it right. Um, and when it's wrong, when it's you wrong, can't help hearing it and going, that just sounds uh, cheesy. That sounds like wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, it, to me, like the way I started mixing was, um, well, I mean, I worked for Rick Rubin a lot and you're not really allowed to use reverb on Rick Rubin records. He hates reverb. So Chili Peppers, Bone Dry, Avid Brothers, mostly Bone Dry. And, um, you know, so, so I had to figure out ways of making things interesting without using reverb. So I used a lot of delays and slaps and, and harmonizers and, and things like that. Have you, have you, do you want to share anything about, um, the reasoning behind bone dry records? Is well, there sort of a logic or a thinking behind it? I think, I think Rick is, a, Rick, well, first of all, Rick is a music fan first. Like he doesn't know about technical things. He doesn't sing, play instruments, any of that stuff. So he just wants to hear the band in the room and if you if you're he feels that if you're distracted by something it's wrong like if that's why the vocals in Rick Rubin produced records are always really loud there's no mistaking the vocal and the snare drum those are the two loudest right. things on any nice. Rick Rubin record and um you know i just sort of took that and ran with it so i made a lot of really dry records and i love that i really love I having the stems, vocal stems from the right beastie boys a little bit um it could do. I'm I'm not really sure where where it comes from. It's all from about for the him. vocals and the the drums. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's dry. It's dry as as a bone on that stuff. Yeah. And it's all about the drums and vocals. Yeah. So that that's that's an interesting point. I never thought about it that way. But um. So I sort of took took that and ran on a lot of records. And now I've developed a lot of other things to to play with and multiple reverbs and and effects and things like that. But um, the Lumineers, you know, are famous for drowning in a well of reverb. Um, and so when I worked on that record, it was like more reverb, more reverb, more reverb. Can you turn the reverb up? I need more reverb. Um, and I, I finally figured out like, oh, okay. All right. Well, I have to figure out how to make myself happy and them happy. So let's find the perfect reverb for these guys. And there's no such thing as the perfect reverb because, you know, things are going to change depending on the tempo of the song, the key of the song, the style of the vocal and, you know, where he's singing in his register and things like that. Um, but generally on the Lumineers record that I did on um, Ophelia, it's a UAD EMT 140 plate reverb. Um, and on that record, I just use it as was, um, you know, just the plug in, you know, re aux send to the reverb. And I'd roll, I'd, there's like a low cut filter, I think, on it. And I use that depending on, you know, what was happening and what sounded good. Sometimes I'd put an EQ before it or after it to shape it a little bit more, get it out of the way of things, um, or, you know, negate any resonances that were happening. Um, the pre-delay would vary depending on tempo of the song and, and what it needed to do. What are what are some things, if somebody's messing with pre-delay for the first time, what are some things they might want to listen for to understand what it does? Pre-delay blew my mind when it was first pointed out to me when I was like 19 years old. And my friend's like, dude, check this out. You can make the reverb happen later. It's like, whoa. Uh, and then I started, you know, I forgot about it. And, and that know, was also, back. sorry, when you were 19, that was, um, we were talking about a digital delay or were we talking about the plate and actually hitting a tape machine to bounce I was like it a, off? I was a 4 I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> that was my, actually like my a, introduction <laughs> to it. But I was like, I was, you know, 20. Six at that point. Or yeah, that's, this was in the '90s. It was probably like a, uh, was like a Lexicon 480 or something like that. Um, but uh, you know, my friend, a guy who was just ahead of me in, in engineering, you know, career-wise, was showing me this thing. And um, pre-delay can 
make the reverb more or less obvious. You, it, basically, it's delaying the signal going into the reverb. And so if you want the reverb to be separated from the source, uh, you add more pre-delay. And you can put it in time with the record. So it's like kind of thing on yeah. the drums. Like that can be really cool on a slow jam. Um, it can it can glue the reverb more to the vocal or it can detach it more. Um, it's actually a really powerful tool to affect how that reverb um, relates to what you're putting into it. Right. It can be a way to still have a lot of reverb on something, but not kind of uh, wash out the vocal detail, right? right? Or make right. the vocal feel like it's it's sitting back. The vocal could still feel forward if you pre-delay the verb yeah. a little bit. And so that that was a lot of what I played with on the Lumineers record, because he loves a lot of reverb. And it's like, all right, well, how can I make every word he's saying intelligible? Another Rick Rubin characteristic, you need to hear every single word. Uh, every single syllable, every detail of the word. How can we do that, but yet still achieve this beautiful floaty reverby sound? And so I would play with the how the low end was affecting the reverb and um, the width of it. Sometimes it was really wide, sometimes it was really narrow. Sometimes I'd have a plate that was really wide and you know around two seconds, and then another one that was mono that would be like three seconds. So the reverb would go from wide to narrow like oh, as, cool. the, as it decayed. Um, there's all you know. There's a million and one different ways to do things. Like I worked for Phil Ramone back in the day, who produced like Simon and Garfunkel and and Billy Joel, and he always had two mono plates, hard hard pan left and right, just for the vocal. Nothing was allowed to be in that reverb except for the vocal. And he would set them to slightly different times, so it'd be this really wide stereo image of a plate reverb. And he would have different pre delays going on each one. And in fact, um, you know that remember that Marshall AR three hundred. It was called the tape eliminator. And I'm not sure if I remember that one. So you were just mentioning using a tape slap to make the uh, to use it for pre-delay going into a plate. So Phil Ramone decided I need something electronic to do this because the tape keeps running out. So they Marshall Electronics invented the AR300. It stands for nice. AR Studios, which was someone and Ramone Studios, and 300 was the amount of milliseconds that it could. Now um, was Marshall delay. Electronics not not the guitar company, but was this the microphone company that was making Marshall mics? No, or was this, somewhere, was, somewhere this was going back that. to the 70s. Okay, I, I right, actually right, don't yeah, know yeah. if that was part of um, the guitar Marshall amp Lance, company. Yeah. I have no idea. But they made this thing called a time modulator that's like this insane um, analog time modulation device that is... I know they got really expensive for a while, but now I think you can have a plug-in that does everything. Right. But, um, you know, there's all these different kinds of reverbs we have. There's plates, there's, you know, digital emulations of weird things from the 80s that don't really sound like halls, but we now identify them as hall reverb. And, you know, you get altiverb, you can have samples of everything on the planet. It's like, what do I use? Um, I try to limit my palette. Like when I yeah. go into a record, I decide, I try a few things and it's like, okay, this, these are the two or three reverbs I'm going to use. And sometimes they're at the same time. Sometimes like the verse is this reverb and the chorus is that reverb um, to try to create like a bigger space. Like, okay, we're stepping from a small space in the verse to a big space in the chorus or vice versa, maybe, you know, um, there's, there, yeah, there's, there's a million and one different tricks. Um, Do you find that you sort of um, welcome the elimination of options? Like as soon as you can say no to something, you're like, thank God, this feels oh, great. You have, you have to know what you don't want to know what you want. You know what I mean? Like you have to be able to instantly recognize that sucks or that's not great. We want great always, yeah. you know? And if this isn't great, why should I even consider using this? So, you know, yes, there's all these plugins, but you, you know, you can achieve things very quickly with a handful of different options. I mean, yeah. it's called options paralysis. When you have too many things, you can't move forward. And, you know, and I have friends who are like, oh my God, have you tried this? I'm like, no, because I have 15 reverbs already. Do I really need another one? And I don't even know how to use these ones. It's, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. it's silly. So I, I have a little mixing template when I start a record and I've got a plate, a chamber, a 480, a bunch of delays. Um, and I have like a couple of spring reverbs and that's pretty much it. If I can't make it happen with that, then I'll go fishing for something else. Um, but I, I, I try to keep it organic and traditional. And, you know, if we want to get weird, I got weird. I got plenty of weird. Um, and that will, you know, we can embark on on an expedition to try to find the ultimate weird. Uh, and, you know, you just, I'm not afraid to click through presets on some reverb to find something interesting or, or Yeah. Do you out. have a method of when you stumble on something that you're like, ooh, that's a really cool setting or that's pretty cool. Do you have a method of sort of like putting that in a favorites folder or squirreling that away so that I should, you don't have to I look don't. through so many things next time? 
I should, but I don't. Yeah, but and, I think there's probably a good reason for that. I mean, I, I also don't necessarily have that. I think about, I feel the same way, but. Well, it's a problem because then you keep going back to the same thing. You know, um, I remember when I worked for Joe Barisi as his assistant for a little while, he's like, I was like, I saw his list of gear and I'm like, oh, where's the so-and-so? He's like, well, I used that on the last record. I didn't bring it. I don't want to use the same thing twice in a row. And I was yeah. like, that's cool. You know? I remember hearing that about Air, mm. um, that those guys would, and I don't know if it's 100% accurate, but you know, the stories we take away, that's the real value anyway. But it was that they would collect a bunch of gear and then make that record with it and then they'd just sell it. Yeah. And then they'd get different gear for the next record. So they had a whole yeah. different palette that, of it's, stuff to it's work cool. with. It's and, cool. And I, you know, I have presets that I, you know, may start with on certain things. I've made presets for, you know, UAD plugins and stuff like that as a basis from which to start. And I forget that they're there and I still just, you know, go and do what I'm going to do. start from scratch, I right? start from scratch because it's like, I know where I'm going and I know how to get there. So I might as well just do it because this kick drum is different from the one yesterday. This guitar is, you know, on a punk rock song and not, you know, a, a gentle ballad. So, you know, I don't, I don't, need those necessarily. If I, if I don't know what I want, then it may click through these things. And like on sound toys plugins, I always cl click through these plugins because you may find something that's completely weird and inspirational oh, that so you would cool never things, have yeah. come up with. Yeah. You but know? some of those sounds, sometimes I hear them like, this is really cool, but I would, I would probably have started by writing the part based on this sound as opposed to Perhaps. just adding it later, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's really too or you, or you, you find some preset like, man, that's so cool, but not for this song. It's like, all right, I can remember that the crystallizer is set on wet pad you know, for the next time. And, you know, that's a really good setting, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about, um, let, let's segue to mixing for a moment and talk about uh, the process of mixing. So for example, when I hear you talk about that, I'm reminded of the experience I go through where I'm like, all right, if I'm mixing a 10 song record, that first song may take a lot more time. And I may have to go through that, like, like I'm cooking from scratch. Yes. And the rest of the songs, it's like I've already, I, I don't know what's my, I know where I'm going with the analogy, but I've already like preheated a bunch of things. Now I can just use. Right. Well, you've, you've made settings, that, you've you made know? that recipe already and you've memorized it. So you know what ingredients are going to go in and then you can riff off of that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, with people say it's cheating to import your settings from one song to the next. And it's like, well, when I was mixing on a console, the settings were already there. Yeah, but I guess Brian just, Eno was cheating too, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Lanois has the thing where he just puts up, you know, he'll mix a song and get it done and print it. And then he puts up every other song on the record through those settings without just changing case, anything right? just yeah. to see if something magic happens. That's great. And then he moves on to the next song and then does and, the same and, thing. You know, I've been wondering, like, um, we, what, how could we do that in Pro Tools and make it easy and not like a new chore? Oh, man, there, I there really no isn't. Idea. I guess you just do an import and just random... Don't even look at the settings. Just import a bunch of shit. Yeah. Do a random print and see what happens. Yeah, and and that's happened before. Like I had some. I was working on something where I I just got this quick rough mix. I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. And I was like, I printed that, and then I beat it, you know, handily later. But it's like, wow, this is, this is pretty good after for five, you know, for importing some. I, I actually I think I just imported the settings and push play, and it's like, wow, that, that's. Pretty close. I've done that too, and I was always like patting myself on the back that like my you know my template from the first song was was pretty good that it was yeah. working on the next one. Yeah. And sometimes you go to the next song, you pull in that template, and you press play, and it sounds really cool. And then you're like, I find myself going like, oh, but wait a minute, like, am I really just is this just like a random change? It's really <laughs> the best thing. And then it's like, dude, it's yeah. if it sounds cool, it sounds cool. Who cares? You know? Yeah. I mean, it's it's of the moment. Uh, everything that we do is is of the moment. And as soon as we start thinking about it, we'll fuck it up. Yeah. And I, and I find myself doing that a lot. Like, you know, I, I remember asking Jim Scott when I was his assistant, I'm like, how do you know when the mix is done? He's like, he's like, well, you know, when there's nothing left to do, when you feel good about everything and you've, you know, you've, you feel like you've done a good job and you're like dancing and, and having a good time. Yeah. Like get, get out before you fuck it up. Like stop changing things. Cause as soon as you go down that path, you're going to completely ruin everything you've just spent the last two solid hours of concentration creating. Exactly. Um, all right. So, uh, let's see what I want to ask you else about that. Um, what about, let me, let me throw in a business side question to that. So somebody comes to you with a 10 song record, you've got a budget, you can kind of figure, all right, I'm going to spend the time on the first one. The next ones may go quicker. It's all going to work out. Do you sometimes have to struggle with answering the question of, well, can we just do one song or two songs? And then you're like, <laughs> well, okay, but it's, you know, gonna, that first song takes yeah. longer. The other ones might take less. Well, yeah. People, a any people, tips about that? People call me and they're like, can we do a test mix? And I'm like, yeah, you can pay for it. 
I'm not going to do a free test mix. I've done a hundred records you can go and listen to and, and understand like how I do things. Uh, I'm happy to do a song for you, but you're going to pay my card rate. Right. And if you like it, which I think you will, then we can do the rest of the record and, and you know, we'll, we'll make a deal. But uh, so it's sort of like <laughs> that first if, song takes far longer because you have to figure out how this person cut it and what they were yeah. intending to do with that and what their sound is. And sometimes it's obvious and sometimes you're going to take it's going to take a couple revisions to get there. And it's sort of like saying, um, all right, you're, you're asking if before we do this project, we could do some work to try and better understand where we're going with this. Mm -hmm. And the answer is Absolutely. Why don't you go do some work to listen to my hundred other records <laughs> and find out, do a little discovery and find out where you think we can go with this? Yeah, I mean, there was a there was a band that I worked with a long time ago uh, who shall remain nameless, and they're gone anyway. But they went around to guys in they LA. They usually are. They they asked uh, a bunch of dudes to do test mixes, and they gave them each a different song, and they got their record mixed for free. And that's a really shitty thing to do. You know, you don't go to your doctor and say, "Hey, can you give me an exam just to see how I am?" And then if I need surgery, we'll do that. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You go to your doctor, you pay for the exam, and you know they'll take care of you. Yeah. So now they know what's what your issues are. <laughs> um, all right. Well, good. Great advice. So um, now I've got a few more questions to jump back to some of the bands you're working with. Uh, El Macho, great great band from here in Nashville. Oh, yeah. Those guys are so fun. David Mead, one of the original members of Joe Mark's Brother. You were talking about mm -hmm. uh, referencing those guys as well. Um, Global Line Dance was one off Vovo, I think, if I'm mm -hmm. getting that, the album title right. <laughs> and there, there's a, there was a quality that immediately I felt and heard in that, and I was trying to put it in words, and I, I couldn't even think of a word. I, I wanted to say anthemic, but it wasn't anthemic. It was just, it has this like celebratory, like over the topness to it. Mm. And and the only thing I could think of it is it's kind of like a YouTube, YouTube groove with delay kind of vibe, the, mm -hmm. way, the way those guys do that. And I wondered if you could, um, you know, what can you teach us about getting a sound and a mix right for a track like that that has that? And like, what what's the word I'm looking for to describe that kind of sound, song or music? It's just it's exciting. You yeah, it's know? like an excitement. I, I don't I don't know if I could come up with a really good adjective, but I mean that song we cut with that band. I cut them the three of them live. They're incredibly skilled musicians. Uh Lindsay Jameson on drums, David Mead played guitar and and, and Butterfly, Butterfly Boucher yeah. on bass and, and great. they all sang. But we cut the the three of them live just instrumentally. You know, we didn't we didn't sing. That one was not to a click and it speeds up like a bit of a demon in the chorus. My only resentment on that record. I wish it didn't speed up so much. But um I mean, it's a party song, you know? It's yeah, like party song. It's, there you go. Like, That's the it's word. Got this, it's got this, you know, sort of Lanois-esque kind of thing going on in the verses, sort of talking heads. Like, they they remind me of, like, a combination of, like, talking heads, uh, Zuropa U2, and, like, the police. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's this yeah. very strange combination. They make a lot of noise for three people, and, you know, they're all, like I said, very talented musicians, but Butterfly has an ear like nobody I've ever worked with yeah. before. Like when we were mixing that record and then we've, we've done another EP that's in the bag. We haven't released it yet. Um, she pushes me harder than any client I've ever worked with. And it, and she's cool. Cause she's just like, you know, like that's really cool and everything, but, but there's not enough edge to it. Right. She'll tell me like literally in those words, she's like, something needs to, you got to fuck something up here. And I'm like, all right, cool. Let's, let's, you know, give me, I was like, Oh, I got an idea. Give me 10 minutes. And they'll go in the lounge and I'll shut the door and, work on something. She's like, yes, that's exactly what I was hoping you'd do. Or nice. like, no, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> and then I have like a pedal board on the floor with a bunch of Earthquaker pedals and oh, crap. I love putting pedals and, on the floor. You know, and I'm just like, let's run the vocal through some weird shit and see what happens. And I'll just put it on loop record in the verse and, you know, she and I'll get down on the floor and manipulate pedals. And That's what I was going to ask you. I was going to yeah. say, when you are getting into pedal land, do you just get out of your chair and just get right oh, yeah, down you on got the floor to. and start just like throwing pedals around and plugging yes. them in? Yes. It's literally a get out of your chair kind of mission, you know, and, and yeah, we'll just throw stuff on the floor and put, put things in different orders. And, and, you know, she and I and David will be down there like twisting knobs and just yeah. see what happens. It's one of the times where I get to feel most like a mad scientist in yes. the studio. And I don't do it enough because a lot of times you're, you're trying to move quickly to get yeah. shit done. And I, I also, it's like, there's that Mo that kind of moment of of you know mad scientist discovery, and then I have this very like mission oriented focused mode of like yeah. I just need to get this done, and like you know I'll I'll just sit in the chair for like an hour or two hours 
with no distractions, no no disruption, no distraction, no dogs, no kids, no assistance, and just focus on mixing and have everything done. And like, okay, now I can go, first of all, take a break, get out of the seat to get a breath of fresh air. But now let's do mad scientist mode for a minute and see what we need mad to do Mad scientist here. mode is one of my favorites for sure. And I agree with you that they're different. They're like different chapters of the making of the record. Yeah. And mad scientist is like capture, 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 then sort. Or maybe just capture and, and make a decision right then and don't don't yeah. leave something for sorting. Yeah, leaving stuff for sorting is very dangerous and takes a lot of time that yeah. is completely unnecessary. If you make your decisions at the moment, it's so much easier. And it's a, you can always go back, you know, but be decisive. Like if you're, you know, doing an acoustic guitar overdub, don't just take 17 takes and decide later because now you're going to have to – so you're going to sit there for three hours sorting through 17 takes of and this shit before you can right? move on. It for every minute, for every um, minute of music that you do that playlist for, it takes like half an hour, forty five minutes to really comp it. Yeah, and that's a waste of time. Yeah, decide right then: is this good? Do it. If not, do it again. Shit, punch in that one bar. Pretend you're on tape for a minute. You know, and if you have a skilled musician in the chair, you can sit there and punch bars if you have to. Like, oh man, you know that. Let's get that fill again. You know, I mean, I I worked with a young band. This kid, uh, this drummer was. 13 years old, son of the original drummer from Pearl Jam, Dave Cruzen. We go into the Village Studios because he he got a connection there through his mom and cut an EP for them. And, you know, he's out there. He had practiced to a click. 13 years old, this kid. 13 years old. He's four foot tall with his drum kit. And, you know, we're cutting the band live. And I'm like, cool, man, that was a great take. I think everybody's good on that one. I was like, um, Jagger, can you punch in the fill going into the third chorus? He's like, yeah, no problem. I'm like, oh, I'm going to play you from the beginning of the verse. You know, I gave him eight bars thinking it's going to take him a minute to to catch up. Two beats in it. He's like on it, punch him in, punch him out. And I was like, holy crap, that was just flawless. If a 13-year-old can punch in, a 26-year-old can punch <laughs> in. A 32-year-old can punch stars. in. And if they can't, they shouldn't be in the studio. You know, yeah. if you can't figure out what's going on intuitively yeah. in a recording studio, get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I feel like when I'm on an instrument, it's easier for me to grasp the ability to punch something in at times. Yeah, but it's also harder for me to actually do the punch in. So I, I rarely get to work with another talented engineer if I'm doing the recording. So yeah, that's why I have auto punch, man. Yeah, well, I'll do that. <laughs> but but even that feels at times yeah. like I'm having to take my brain out of musician yeah. and think about the computer it's and then hard. go back to musician. It is hard. I shouldn't be so black and white about it because it is it is a difficult process and with. With Pro Tools, especially like if you're trying to cut some, if you're trying to punch in and you're like, you got a bunch of plugins on other tracks, it really throws you out. So I've developed methods of of making that easier where like, you know, there's a quick key to put the track in record, you know, option K. And, you know, so you drop them into input two right. bars before yeah. you're going to punch, then you punch and then you punch out and you, there's no, it's it's seamless if you do that. Like yes. you, you, you don't, it, there's not this like... Kind of like you drop right at the you moment know, three of the milliseconds yeah, or yeah, ten exactly. milliseconds from the playback to the drop in, um, because of, for whatever reason it, it does it like that. But what's funny is when I work with somebody who's not used to that, I then have to explain what just happened because they're like they think I punched yeah. in the wrong place or yeah. something. No. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, some okay. some people notice, some people don't, but it, it depends on the level of musicianship and studio experience, yeah. things like that. So yeah, I'll, I'll take back my black and white statement. No, no, and that, but <laughs> it, I think what's important is it's deceptive <laughs> the idea of. Uh, doing a bunch of stuff and saving it for the comp later. Yeah. The deception is giving everybody in the room this impression that we're being super efficient, efficient and finishing this task quickly and moving mm -hmm. on. But we're not because we have to come back and do a lot of work later. Yeah. And if I do all those takes and I'm recording myself, I just know that I'm going to have to like put in an, an hour or something yeah. of sorting through stuff. I hate comping. I get, I get what I call compilepsy. I start falling asleep. <laughs> I literally yeah. just zone out and I'm like, whoa, the whole song just played. Shit, what just <laughs> happened? But I mean, and of course there's exceptions to that. Like I think with singing, you know, you, you know, hunt and gather, comp, comp together the best thing. But with with music, you know, especially with, with musicians in Nashville, as, as good as they are, like, you know, we'll have the baddest studio musicians out there and, you know, you finish a take like, yep, yeah, that's, that's the take. And, you know, the bass player raises his hand. I need uh, bar three and four, the second chorus, and then I need to punch in the bridge. And yeah. it's like the piano player will be like, I need this, this, and this. And they'll remember exactly which parts they didn't feel good about. We'll punch them in, and then they'll get out of their chair and come in. Then the next guy and the next guy. So you know. so um, one of the first sessions I sat in on was with my good friend Chuck Pfaff, who was working at County Q doing do it right there in Berry Hill. 
doing country demos. That's where he started mm-hmm. out. And I was blown away to see, go in and watch him do a session. You know, they're doing like the four hour block where they get five songs done and they would rehearse the song once and then they, he would press record and they'd roll it and they'd get to the end of the song and then everybody would raise their hands. He'd be rewinding. He'd write down where the punches were. And on the MCI tape machine, he'd press go and some, you know, somebody's in from the top and then somebody else, when they get up to theirs, you drop, you arm those two yep. tracks and repunch in and drop oh. them in, and somebody else repunches in later or punches yep. out. And that's what I'm waiting to see. I miss, something like Pro I Tools. I wish to we could have something like that on Pro Tools. Yeah, One pass really with a room full of great musicians and just yeah. drop in and out where you need them with a few buttons. Because yeah. we could do it if it was you, easy. Because you save five minutes. Yeah, that's an expensive five minutes. It is in the an studio. expensive five minutes, you know, but it's, you know, it is what it is these days. And, yeah. And it's, it's also, it's incredible what we can, the power of, of, of you know Dawes and yeah whatever that we we'll can, get we there can deal with. we'll get there we can have whatever yeah. the the tape machines in the Daw we can have uh, instant punch in on you individual tracks you would hope I think you could do that on a radar can't you uh, probably get probably radar but you got to have a console too that's true all right so um, let's see 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 okay third eye blind we are drugs when I was flipping through there I found uh, I added to the YouTube playlist it was one of you know plays through a bunch of songs this, and I flipped through. I was reminded of the challenge that we face sometimes when you're mixing an album to have consistency in that lead vocal yeah. across song to song. And I wondered if you wanted to just talk about that that experience. Are there ways that you check yourself to make sure that there is consistency? Because um, the vocal treatment isn't always exactly the same from song to song, but no, it I needs mean, to sound unified on the record. Yeah, I mean, you know, how you treat a vocal, uh, I mean, you want to be in the same wheelhouse, generally. Um because otherwise it'll stand out, and it's like, well, what is this record about? Like, I don't, I don't even. What understand is a wheelhouse this. anyway? Is that like a steamboat <laughs> reference, or is uh, that like, is that the the wheelhouse where the train goes in I and wonder, turns I around think and that's, goes back? That out? must be what it is. That must be what it is. Because you're keeping the train in the house. Uh, I don't know, but I use it often. That's it. Keep the train in the house yeah. for for vocals on a record. Yeah, you you want to stay in the same in the same general vicinity of of, of processing and, and treatment and stuff like that. I mean, you know, on this on the Third Eye Blind records, you know, he recorded all his vocals the same way. He always uses an SM7, and uh, you know, whatever he has at his studio, it's it's pretty much always the same. And his so, so recording with the same setup is a good big step towards consistency on the record. It's, it's one way, but. Um, you know, as long as the vocal is captured well, you know, I get a lot of recordings that are like the wrong mic. It just sounds bad. It's in a shitty sounding room or whatever. If you can get a good recording of the vocal, that's the first step. And and like on the record I'm working on right now, this girl, Molly Tuttle, you know, we've I've used, I think, three different mics on her. Um, no, two, the SM5 and my Chandler Red mic. And there's certain songs she sounds better on the Red, certain songs she sounds better on the SM5. Um, but it always still sounds like her. But, um, you know... On a record that I'm not recording, like the, I don't think, We Are Drugs, I actually may have recorded a couple of those songs, but he did his vocals uh, after he left town. He went back to San Francisco for that. Um, you know, I just, I, I import my settings from one song to the next, and um, we'll start with that and then sort of jump off and treat things uh, uh, differently depending on the song. But, uh, you know, as far as vocal levels, I think the level is the most important thing, mm-hmm. is to keep that sort of, you know, the focus of the song, like I was saying earlier, it's like, you, you. I like making a record with a vocal that's clear and concise, and you can hear every syllable that the person is singing. Um, I have this, behind my console, I have this, this mo- I have my my monitors like right in front of me, and, and, it, and it's mounted on a pole, and there's a, the pole sort of sticks up behind the, the, the video monitor, and I imagine the singer's head on that pole. It's a disgusting image, but I imagine them <laughs> being up front, on top of the mix, like visually on top and in front of things. And if, and if I can't visualize the singer there, then it's not right. You know? Yeah, I think that's good. And, and, um, I guess it would be weird to have a record where you've got the vocals sitting like that on one song and then you get to the next one and it's like a punk rock track where the vocals buried, you know, those, those, that wouldn't necessarily make sense on an album. Yeah. It it would be a little weird. And, and, you know, after you do this a long time, it's just sort of second nature, you know, Uh, uh, one important thing, it's not even nothing to do with mixing. And this is, this is one of my favorite tips. And I know this is going to be one of your questions is come up with a concise, like one place on your monitor pot that you listen or two places. I have a loud, a loud setting and a soft setting and that's it. I don't go anywhere else. It's either at four on my controller or 
minus 24, or I think it's four and 24, something like that. Anyway, whatever those two places are. Which controller do you use? I have a Cranesong Avocet, the ugliest monitor controller ever made, but it sounds wonderful. I've seen a lot of those in Nashville. Yeah. And so like I have my loud setting and then I have pushed the dim button and it dims it down to the quiet setting. And I never change where those two things are. I have three sets of speakers. So like the loudest setting is on my Pro Ax. And then, you know, I have NS10s that are equally loud, but then, you know, I, I, I never listen to NS10s loud because it just hurts my ear. And then I have a little boom box off to the side, a little like Bose wave radio. But anything that sounds like anything will, will be good. And, you know, I just throw that off in the corner uh, as like the sort of background music check. Like, can I hear the vocal still? Can I hear the snare? Can I hear the most important element of the song at this moment? Yeah, which is emulating somebody just casually listening to it yes. in their kitchen while yeah, they're making I, I have dinner a Sonos, or something. I have a Sonos speaker up on top of the cupboard in my kitchen. And and I paid, I'm like, you know, I'll hear things that I mixed on some channel on, you know, XM radio or, you know, Pandora or whatever. Something I mixed will come up in a in a mix. I'm like, oh shit, I can't hear the acoustic guitar. I probably should have paid attention to that a little more. <laughs> when you mix a full album of songs, is there sort of a process with which you're going through to just kind of get away from them and then check them? And and do you collect your own thoughts around all those songs as a collection where you're just going to go back in and make some more tweaks and adjustments to them, whether uh, it's vocal or any other aspect of it? Um, is is that at a stage where it's sort of back and forth with the client too? Anyway? Yeah, I always I always expect to make revisions on, a, on an album. Um, I mix in a hybrid sense. I have like a summing bus and outboard gear in addition to all the stuff that I do in the computer. Uh, so, you know, we take pictures of all the settings and I can recall things in about five, I should say my assistant can recall things in about five or 10 minutes and bring it back to 99.9% perfect. Uh, but generally what I do these days is if uh, I'll mix the first song and send it to the client and make sure we're on the same page, we'll dial that song in and I'll be like, cool, I'm going to mix the rest of the album and I'm going to send it to you all at the same time. Here's another trick. If you send them 12 songs, they can't fuck it up because now they're going to hear the album as a collection. Rather than like, oh, well, you know, just, I'm, I'm worried that this is going to, you know, this is just too much or this is too little. Or, and you, you know, they'll obsess over these little tiny details on every song and you'll go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And as the mixer, you're just like, well, I don't give a shit anymore. You've changed everything or you've got all these, no one cares about X, Y, and Z. You know, like, oh, can you make the shaker a half a dB louder? It's like, sure. It becomes an exercise in email. It, it beca yeah, it's silly, especially if they're not there. So I mix, you know, like I said, I'll do the first song, maybe the second song, you know, we'll go back and forth um, and and do that sort of thing. But then I mix the rest of the record because that's what I do. I'm a mixer. And you hired me for my opinion on what your shit should sound like. Uh, and generally, you know, that works really great. And a lot of times, like, I'll send it to them. They'll send me their first round of notes, which are sort of big picture things. Like, okay, cool. I'll recall every song in the course of a day or two, do those notes. And then, you know, some actually a lot of times I'll have the band come down come where from wherever they are, if they're able to, like come into Nashville and let's hang out and like do this one-on-one. -on -one. And then you'll hear it on my speakers. You can take it into your car. You can bring your little boom box, whatever. And then it becomes like this interactive thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's going to be really fun. Too, it's it's way more fun to have it in person because emails are very impersonal. And you can say something in an email that when the other person is reading it, it's like, you know, they may get offended or confused or do the wrong thing or take it the wrong way. And that happened when I was working with a band of German guys where they're very, they're blah, 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 you know, and like accused. And it it came to me, it came across to me as accusatory when they were like, oh no, man, we love your mix. It's just, this is how we feel about blah, blah, blah. And they, they didn't really write it in a feeling sense. They yeah. just wrote it as a laundry list of shit they, they wanted like, changed. We mean bad meaning good, not <laughs> bad meaning bad. <laughs> yeah. And then, but then they they came down to Nashville and, and you know, we vibed it out and had so much fun and they became like really good friends. Whereas at first I was like, I'm never going to talk to these motherfuckers again, you know, but then we got to be really good friends. I did more work for them and, you know. And you're like, now I'm a huge fan of Helmet. <laughs> No, so, um, all right, so let's talk about mastering now. Mm -hmm. um, what should the rock stars know about choosing a great mastering engineer on their next record um, about that process if they don't have a lot of experience, big budget or small budget? Just well, what, what do you want to share about that? Um, I remember going to a party with a mastering friend of mine, and someone asked him how much he charged. And he gave a number and they're like, whoa, that's expensive. He's like, well, you get what you pay for, man. I've been doing this 20 years. He's like, oh, well, I have a guy who masters things for like 50 bucks. He's like, well, good for you. 
how's that sound? And he's like, oh, well, you know, this record and that record. And I knew the records that the kid was talking about. I'm like, and I just sort of called him. I'm like, those records sound terrible. Those are not good sounding records. Oh, well, you know, it's, it's jazz. And so blah, blah, blah. I'm like, they sound terrible. <laughs> those, are, uh, those are objectively bad sounding records. Listen, for $1,000, I can make you a $51 sounding record. <laughs> It's it's interesting because you know people confuse you know money with um, I don't even know how to say an obstacle. This. I don't know. Well, there's an obstacle, but it's like you know don't be afraid to call the expensive guy with the name on the with with his name on on the jacket because if you call him and say hey look I, I got a mastering I want to master this record this is the money I have can I send you a couple tracks see if you're into it because you never know and if you say to a guy like I'm not in a hurry I got a month I have my deadline is is next month. Can you fit this in somewhere? I'd really appreciate it. I love your work on this record, this record, and this record. Call them up. Email them. You know, the worst they can say is no. Yeah. And if you develop a rapport with a mastering engineer or a mixer or a producer, all of a sudden, you know, you're friends with them and they'll want to work with you. But if you're a jerk and you and you come at it like, you know, I need you to do this, da-da-da-da, you know, they're like, ah, you know, no. I, and I, I go to, like, I do small budget records sometimes because I love music. I love working with people who are talented. And it's like, you know, if there's a way to make this work for everybody, I'm in. And then, you know, it's like, I'll go to a guy that I've mastered 20 records with. Like, yo, bro, I don't have a lot of money on this. Can you squeeze this into your schedule at some point? And they'll say yes or no. Yeah. And if they say no, then I go to the next guy. And it's like, it's okay. I mean, you I know, we're all here to make money. If we were an airline, we'd have really nice first class seats, but we've also got some other seats that we need to fill yeah. too. Yeah, so, we, you know. we got coach, you know, if you want to put yourself in a pet carrier, you can ride downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> How's that record sound? Yeah, but you know, or you can take the Greyhound bus, you'll get there. You know, you'll get to your destination, it just might take I've you longer. Done it. it didn't smell so good. No, but uh, you know, it's like, uh, what's what's the, the three things? Um, uh, quality... Uh, you know what I'm talking there about. There are the, the no other two. The, the it's triangle. just quality. The, no, you I know, don't know. Uh, uh, good, cheap, quick. Pick two out of three. Good, cheap, quick. All right. That's that's like you draw the you draw the triangle. Good, cheap, quick. Pick two out of three. It's like you want it good and cheap. It's going to take a long time. You want it quick and and great. It's going to cost you a lot of money. You know. Yeah. Right. Uh, so it's like if someone comes to me and says, you know, I've got a, a record I need mixed. Uh, I've only got this much money. I was like, well, if you got two months, I'll fit it in between other things. You know. Uh, as long as you take care to send me these tracks in the best possible way, so I don't have to fuck around. Yeah, uh, you know we can make this work. But if it's something that sounds terrible, it's like this is going to take me two days to mix a song. I can't do it for that much money. Let's go there for a sec. Um, do you just have a conversation with people? Are you, well, first of all, are you used to working with people that know how to send you good tracks to mix? Do you sometimes have to have a conversation? Do you have any tips for people about how to make that conversation easy and not difficult about educating your clients to deliver you the right um, thing to work with before, so that you can make your own work efficient? It varies because I've gotten records that sound absolutely incredible. You know, I mean, I've been fortunate to mix some of Joe Ciccarelli's tracks and those just like mix themselves. I mean, you literally spend like two or three hours and it's done. Uh, and then I've gotten records where it's just like, where did you put this microphone? You know, what did you do to this sound to make it this bad? Uh, and it's like, you can't just use the unplacement plugin. I wish, I wish there was something like that, but, but then we'd all be bad engineers. You know, people confuse, uh, you know, home recording with just stick a mic in front of it and the mixer will make it sound good. And it's not always the case. Uh, you know, there's more to recording than sticking a 57 in front of a guitar cabinet and pushing record. You know, what might sound like a good guitar tone to you is actually not that good. And you can't undistort something. Yeah. You can't undo something. But you, you can't can distort it. it later. You can distort something. it. And it's better to err on that side than than the other. And it's like, you know, I I, rec I oftentimes I'll record a DI when I'm doing an electric guitar so I can have an out in case something, you know, that I yeah. thought sounded great at the time, I can now reamp that and 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 get back to something. And yeah, right. you know, that's the first thing you can do. And to, you would record that yourself it. too, that's as opposed to yeah, wishing I, they had I, done that. I record a DI a lot. I don't okay. do it always, um, but I do it quite often. And and it's you know, like I said, it's a level of undo and it also provides transient so you can edit shit later. That's always that's another side benefit of recording a DI on a guitar. Yeah. So let's uh I, I know this sounds like a dumb question, but let's break this down just for the rock stars who maybe mm -hmm. haven't done this yet. Describe the the signal flow of recording a DI'd guitar when you're when you're in a recording situation. So you'd plug straight from the guitar into the DI, and then you'd go out of the parallel jack on the DI into the pedal board or, you know, anything that the guitarist may have between them and the amp. 
And then you go out to that amplifier and into the speaker and through a microphone and and recording that through preamps and EQs and such. Uh, but the DI that I take is always before all the stuff, all the effects. So I want that as clean as possible so I can ruin it again later. Right. You know. And then do you, um, and then just a, a clean mic pre, because you're not really listening to that DI. You're not trying to make no. a sonic choice. No, no, no. I just, I use whatever mic pre's left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's All not right. important. All right, cool. And then um, for the visual guide of editing, um, describe some ways that that might actually look to you as you're working where it's, you know, makes the workflow yeah. easy. I mean, if you're recording like a punk rock session, you're going to go through a, you know, a Marshall or a Vox or something that's going to be super saturated and distorted. And so if you're trying to edit things, you know, you can't do it visually. I mean, I always advocate against visually editing things anyway, but, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I've done it before, you know, and, and I, it's easier, like when you can find the note you're trying to make earlier or later or whatever, it's easy to say like, oh, well, there's the note because it's near beat four of the bar. So I know right, that's the Right, because the DI one is a big spike. Yeah, the DI will be a big the spike. Is- and, you know, because there will be no saturation, no distortion, and you'll you'll see all the transients. And so it makes it easier to to do that. Um, can the DI actually help you judge phase between guitars or anything? Or is that sort of a less, really just a non-issue? Uh, for the bass, you could, because you'll use, you'll record the bass DI and, and use it as part of the sound in a lot of cases. Yeah. And you can, you can check timing and polarity with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, cool. So let's jump into our, our jam session questions, our, our sort of uh, out questions here. But um, when you started out, I mean, you kind of had some real advantages of being around music and being around your dad and seeing all this stuff. But what were some of the things that you felt like were holding you back initially? Um, I mean, honestly, it's it's funny. Like when I have a couple other friends who've come up under their dads as musicians or engineers, and you know, everyone assumes you've got this, you know, wealth of knowledge or or experience or whatever. And and I did in a lot of senses, but my dad was a, my dad got into remote recording specifically so he could record the show, hand the tapes over and leave. He didn't want to be a mixer. He didn't want to sit and do overdubs. He didn't want to do any of that stuff. So I didn't know how studio sessions and mixing sessions went. So I I remember um, one of my first assisting gigs, I was trying to tell the engineer how to do things, you know, because I was like, oh, I know all this shit, la, la, la. And I got cut down at the knees, you know, and and kicked out and sent to re-education on how to do this stuff properly. And it was a really great experience. It was very humbling and uh, and slightly humiliating. But, we, you know, the guy who did that and I became very good friends yeah. later. And it actually set me on a course to assisting Michael Brower, nice. uh, was, you know, big famous mixer guy. And he kicked my ass up and down the street, beat any sense of ego out of me, ironically, um, and, and taught me how to run a, a mixing session. And how to, how cool. to experiment with reverbs and how to have bedside manner and convince people that your way is the right way, you know, yeah, uh, a lot of things. And, and, and it really, it was, it was really, really great. A lot of people, um, when you come from a small town or a small studio, you know, you'll, and I, I run into this all the time with people like in, in small towns and small studios they are like, well, this is the way. And how could you possibly do it any other way? And it's like, because there's a million fucking ways that I haven't experienced you know, and, you know, for someone to say, well, I don't tune vocals. It's like, well, good luck getting a fucking gig, bro. You know, <laughs> well, I do things this way. Cool. Do things that way. See how long that lasts for you. And, you, and then they come to me a year later, like, well, I'm unemployed and I can't afford my mortgage anymore. It's like, because you're being a dick. <laughs> don't be a dick. <laughs> don't be a dick. There's our, there's our tweet right there. Two, two rules in the studio. Don't be a dick and don't smell bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man. Um, and especially as in Nashville, as we go into the hot summer weather here too, you know. I know. Uh, a, lot, a lot of hot sessions. And I, I, I totally understand. And I mean, I can fess up like, you know, I, I've got a home <laughs> studio. I, I come down. It's like, get up, wake up, have yeah. some coffee, come on down, hit the studio. Sometimes I just forget. It's you forget. Like, yes. I do all these dumb things. Like I actually will hide, <laughs> you know, antiperspirant in the, uh, or deodorant rather in the bathroom here oh, in the too. studio. I'll hide yep. it in the car. Yep. Just like all the places where you find yourself and you go, oh shit, I'm I forgot to, uh, right. to get ready. Yeah. I mean, actually there's a bunch of studios in town that in the bathroom, they have spray deodorant and scope on the, on the, in the, in the bathroom. It's like, that is wonderful. Smart moves right there. Yeah. I actually just got a tin of mints to, at my studio, just in a case. Tin of mints. Tin, tin of mints. And I got, I got floss and deodorant and toothpaste and a toothbrush. There you go. So, um, uh, it's that reminder, rock stars. I think that when you have a studio and you're inviting over other people t- over to it, every angle that you can kind of <laughs> think about it as like a hotel 
where oh, you've yeah. got all these extra amenities is, is a pretty good way. Yes. Always to have do it, booze you know? and mouthwash. Um, so one, one comment too, about being young, starting out, you know, showing up in these sessions, I, ex I've seen it many times with young interns who are coming in on my studio sessions. Um, and then I remember acting it myself. There just is a tendency for some reason when you're starting out to, um, do more, you're, like you're more motivated to want to let people know how much, you know than to listen and learn and absorb. And I oh. think that's kind of at the root of it. I think it's just, and and I think it stems from excitement in a way. It's because you're thrilled yeah. about this stuff and you you just want like, I just want you, Ryan, to know that like, I mean, I'm doing it on this fucking podcast. <laughs> I'm like, I want you to know some <laughs> shit that I know. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, it's when, when like when you get an intern or an assistant coming in who, who's young and inexperienced, there's, there's a combination of youthful excitement and insecurity. And, um, I actually just had a, an intern come in just for a day after his Blackbird class got out before he had to go home to Italy. And, you know, he's like a 30-year-old guy, experienced. He didn't make – he was invisible. And that is the goal of being an assistant or an intern. Be invisible. Shut the fuck up and watch. Don't yeah. be on your phone. Don't be looking at your, you know, internet browser unless it, unless it's something to do with something the engineer just yeah, said. The task but don't even make given. it look like that – you could be there, you know, talking to your girlfriend or something. Observe. Because it's it's a rare chance these days to get right. in a room with someone who knows what they're doing, and that is the best way of learning. And it's not a you're in trouble thing. It's a no. don't miss this golden opportunity to absorb and learn. Well, and beyond that, don't disturb the people who are trying to do their work. Like if I'm if I'm sitting there mixing, don't shout a question, you know, at, because I push stop. Like wait wait to be, don't speak unless spoken to. It's like yeah. the old school you know eth ethics for um for you know being a kid. You're in a room full of adults. You are the kid. Even if you're 21, 25 years old, you are the kid in the room. You're the, the fly on the wall. I was 26. Yeah. I mean, like Michael Brower wasn't, it didn't, didn't get into a recording studio until he was 25 years old. Oh, no shit. He was in the mail room at Media Sound or something like that, 25 years old. So anything's possible at any age, but you're still the youngest person, the most inexperienced person in the room. Even if, like, if you were to get your driver's license for the first time at age 30, you're going to suck at driving for a while. Just like a 16-year-old would. Yeah. You know, so if you're invited into a studio, shut the fuck up and yep. just observe and, you know, speak when spoken to. Be be invisible. Don't yeah. hover. Don't stand. Don't shake your leg. You know, like when I was when I was assisting and, Brower and for the first time. by God, time, don't hum a harmony to the part never, that's coming out of the speakers. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't even nod your head in, in time with the music because it's like out of the corner of someone's eye that's very distracting. When The first day I was assisting Brower, I was sitting behind his wall of racks bouncing my foot because I was nervous. And he stops the tape and he's like, you bouncing your foot back there? I was like, yeah. He's like, stop that. It's annoying. I can feel it up here. You're shaking the floor, you know? And it's like, ah. You know, what's really annoying to me is uh, the times where I turn the speakers down low and I'm listening acutely at low volumes. Mm -hmm. And then, and then people in the back room, they take that, they're like, oh, it's like, we're freed up now. Now we can, now we can start talking, you know? No, start it's, it's the like, opposite. No. And it's like, and I, you know, I've, I'm a very uh, non-confrontational person by nature. And, and I've, I've been learning as I've been getting older to speak up and just speak my mind. It's like, someone was in the studio recently. I'm like, yo, if you're going to talk, you got to get the fuck out. Or, you know, you have, yeah. I need you to do that in the lounge. I, maybe I had to be polite to a manager or something like, hey, if you guys are going to have a conversation, I need you to go outside. Yeah. You know, and just, just speak you know, if you're the guy in the chair and you're being distracted, speak with authority. You, you are the authority. You're the engineer in charge. You're in the chair. I watched a, a female engineer uh, doing this big orchestral session for a FedEx commercial for like BBDO, big advertising agency. And there were like eight guys in the room like drinking and carrying on because they were, you know, it's like this $50,000 recording session. Like, la, la, la. And she turned around and was like, hey, guys, I'm trying to record your commercial here. Can you take it in the other room? You know, they're like unwrapping sandwiches and all this stuff. They're like, well, can you can you just like turn the music down? We're trying to have a conversation here. And she's like, well, I can, but this orchestra costs $10,000 an hour. They're like, oh, we're going to go in the other room. <laughs> yeah, I, I can turn it down when it's done. Yeah, yeah, but it was hilarious. in the hilarious. meantime, get the fuck out. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, cool. So uh, let's jump forward to a couple of the last questions here. Um, business side of this, uh, maybe we've talked about it a little bit, mm -hmm. but if if somebody wants to do this for more than just a hobby... What advice do you have for the rock stars about, um, you know, any tips or anything like that for the business side, whether it's advice or a resource online that you use that you think is really hmm. useful, handy? Um, I actually, I have like a little sort of Excel spread, spreadsheet that I made and I only made it recently and I, and I should use it more than I do. 
but it breaks down like if someone says they can do a record for X number of dollars, I break that down into like, it, it's got my little calculations of like, how much is my studio cost me per day to be in? Because I, I, I lease my space at House of Blues. If I'm going to have my assistant, how much is he going to cost? Uh, and then, okay, how many days do I need? How many days can I work to make a comfortable daily rate? And then it, it like literally just calculates all this stuff and spits out a number at the end. It deducts like, you know, I have a business manager, he takes a cut. I have a manager, he takes a cut. I have a lawyer, he takes a cut. I'm like, all right, after all those commissions, after taxes, how much money am I going to make? And it has to be above a certain number. Otherwise, I'm, you know, I'd rather just not do anything. I'd rather work in my garden or, or play do with your my own dog. Music. Yeah, or, or do my own music. And, and I, I have a handful of things that I'm working on. Or practice my piano or, you know, go on a road trip or, or so go this out is, for the day. This is useful if somebody comes and says, uh, what, what can I do for 5000 bucks or 10000 bucks or whatever sure. it is? Then it, you put it in there and it comes out on the bottom and it's like, we can have coffee. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I'm just so kidding. sometimes it's like, you know, you, you have like, do I really want to do this? And as my my buddy Vance Powell says, on the one set, on the one end, there's commerce, which is the big budget records with a lot of money. And on the other end is art, which has zero money and and all the cred, you know? So it's like, I won't mention bands on either side of that because that would be weird. Um, and then there's everything in the middle. Yeah. And so you want to try to find that blend of art and commerce, you know, where you can make some money because this is a job and I have overhead and mouths to feed in my house and, you know, hobbies of, you know, buying gear and playing with cars. So, you know, you got to, at the end of the day, you got to make a couple dollars, right. you know, and you just have to decide, is this artistic enough that it's worth, you know, uh, taking no money for, or is this so much money that I can sacrifice my artistic integrity to do it. Yeah. And, you know, there's merits to both. And again, right. like you want to try to to find that middle ground as frequently as possible. And, you know, and those big commerce projects where you're making a lot of money pay for the ones that, uh, that bring no money, you know? Well, I think it's cool that you made a spreadsheet because there are many times where somebody's like, how much is it per song or, or what can we do for this? And I always sure. feel like, I can give you an answer, but I'm going to have to sit down and figure it out later. Yeah. And so I think it's smart to have some sort of system where you can make that easy for yourself because yeah. you also don't want to waste a bunch of time figuring things out, especially when, you know, the more complex the question is from the person, the more likely that they're, they're not going to follow through on it anyway and, and yeah. actually book the session. And, yeah. the, and I found that the people with the most questions are the hardest to please. Yeah. You know, the people who have the least money and the most questions and hangups about spending their money, letting go of it. You know, they're like, they're giving you the, the check, but they're hanging on to it because they don't want to really give you the money. Right. Those people are a pain in the ass. And you'll learn that lesson over and over and over and over again. Until you it's, finally change your, your I mean, method. You know, it, yeah. And, until, you, and, until you realize, it, like you, you'll, you'll find that way of, of sorting out what I call the red herrings, the people who are just going to fuck with you endlessly. And it's just not worth the aggravation. But yeah. now you've gotten yourself into this thing. And it's like, how do you extricate yourself? I've told, I've, I did a mix for someone and they sent me this laundry list of things that they wanted. And they were just, you know, argumentative and, and, you know, it's like this guy was on gear sluts too many times and thinking about all the wrong things to do with his record. And it's like, dude, if you had just played your part right, uh, you know, or played your drums correctly, this wouldn't be a problem. And I could give you what you wanted, but you're a terrible drummer. And finally, I just said to the the producer who was a friend of mine, I'm like, you know what? I think your drummer should just mix this record. I'm going to just give it, don't, you don't owe me anything. I love you. You're my buddy. Y your drummer should mix this. And, and, and I spent a day and a half on this already, but you know, it's all good. Yeah, and I just walked away from it. It is it sometimes just cut my losses. it's powerful to just walk away from something if you, you can, have you know? to, yeah, and I'm not bitter about it. <laughs> well, I mean, they're hard things to do sometimes. You know, it is because you make. you you know you want to use your skills and help people. It's like you know, there it's like a Chili Pepper wannabe band, and you know, and they were good. And they had some good songs, but it's like you you can tell the professionals from the amateurs by how they treat uh, people who are trying to help them. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, how about some tips for the organizational? Let me say that again. How about some tips for the organizational side of this? Um, oh. Any anything you want to share about keeping your shit together? Yes. Well, for the first thing is have backups of everything. Okay. You know, have you know you need a backup system for your backup system. So you know these days, I'm and I'm actually and again, it's this is, this is something I was hypocritical about until very recently. I bought like a big um, you know 16 terabyte RAID backup array that you know you just push a button and it backs everything up. And now I'm getting a cloud system going. And I have some friends who do like LTO tapes and all that kind of stuff. And it's all fun and games until you lose something and you don't have a backup. Uh, then you're yeah. kind of screwed. Um, is there any just general descriptions of what, uh, of like work drive backup 
drive system that yeah that people, i mean i have i have a work drive that's you know i have a series of work drives that i keep my main copy on and then i have a backup to that and then i have the raid and then i have the the cloud so i have four copies okay. at least four copies of everything at all times if you don't have three you don't have anything um like a buddy of mine uh uh, uh actually well who became a buddy of mine my friend uh who was a client had one copy of his record in his backpack and it was stolen out of his car and he called me in a panic. He's like, hey, do you have a copy of that thing we did two years ago in Toronto? I was like, uh, well, I have the master session. I have the the tracks that we wound up using. I have a consolidated. He's like, Phew. well, that's all I really care about. But I'm so glad you have that. I insisted on taking it and, you know, and having a copy of that. And I've gotten people who call me 10 years after, like, hey, do you still have a copy of our record? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, actually, I do. So uh, maybe you got some tips around that. So I have clients uh, right now that are... Um, asking for, you know, me to put the stuff over onto drive. And uh, for me, I feel like I, I try to communicate, you know, your record is your responsibility. So you need to take it home with you on a drive. That doesn't always seem to work. Some people show up and they, they've automatically got a drive because they're going to work on it. Other artists are just like, they're not going to do anything with it. They, they're like, is a terabyte big enough? You know? Yeah. I mean, I think artists by nature are disorganized. Yeah, or uh, they just don't give a shit about the the tech side. So yeah, they they don't. A lot of people don't understand the gravity of you know what a hard drive is and what is on it, and don't drop it and don't leave it in a hot car and things that are. Basic Any good to tips us. about making sure that they leave with a, a drive so that they've got at least some version of it that is safe, or do you just feel like the best solution is to always have it yourself, no matter what, forever? I mean, I try to keep things as long as possible, but you know, I'm 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 not going to be. I don't feel like I'm mandated to keep it longer. It, like as soon as the record's put out and it's mastered and all that stuff, there's a level of like, whew, okay, cool. But you know, there's like all these remixes that are happening on big albums. You know, it's like we're going back to tapes that are, you know, from the 1960s and yeah. 50s and whatever. And those tapes are still good in most cases. You can play them and digitize them. And now you've got this thing to work on. But these days, like if you drop a hard drive, it's toast, you know? So like, what do you do? Uh, you know, that's why I was my buddy who's got the LTO system of you know, like a, a tape, a data tape backup that is slow as hell, but he will have everything forever, you know, to, to have. And short of putting, dropping your tracks onto an analog tape, yeah. you know, a 24 track tape machine, it's like, what is a future, an absolutely future proof way of backing it up? I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. I feel like the cloud systems should have some way where you can just simply lease out a small portion. So like client comes to make a record with you, you just upcharge the... 25 bucks or whatever for their record to live on that cloud forever. And yeah. you're like, then well, I mean, these days it's, it's so there. cheap, you know, it's so cheap to back stuff up to a cloud now that it's really not a problem. And there's this one, I can't remember the name that a friend of mine turned Is me on to. Backblaze? I think Backblaze. Yeah. Where like, you can call them up and be like, I need a hard copy of that FedEx to me right now. And they'll, they'll, oh, they put it on they'll drive make you a hard drive and send it to you. Yeah, that's pretty hip. It's insane. It's kind of awesome. So. Well, that's a great solution for yeah. the clients when they later come and they say, Hey, I need that thing. You just go. Here it is. It's on that you, you just send them to there and, and then they like yeah. pay the whatever and have the hard drive shipped to them. Sure. Kind of yeah. takes it out of your hands. Yeah, it, it does. And, you know, as long as, you know, you give them two copies of stuff, it's hard to mess that up. Yeah. So, um, you know, but there's, there's no guarantees in life, but you just try to make it as foolproof as possible. Yeah. All right. Dig it. Um, let's go to the last question. We're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine. You go back oh, in boy. time, you find young Ryan Hewitt um, riding his uh, green machine around the remote truck. I had one. <laughs> and and they're going to say, uh, you know, I've come to give you this one bit of advice, young man. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice, well, maybe you're not that little, but what advice would you give yourself if you could go, if you could go back and do that? Uh, take piano lessons. <laughs> All right, dig it. Oh, and you said you're taking them now? Finally, yeah, I too. mean, I, I remember telling, uh, a, you know, the Blackbird Academy kids come over to my studio, uh, you know, once at once per class session, Mark Rubel brings them over and, uh, you know, I'll give them like a little spiel about what I do and where I came from and stuff. And the only regret I had in life, the only regret, the only regret, I, the only regret I truly have in life is not continuing my piano lessons when I was 13 years old. I quit because I was frustrated and I had this friend at the time who was a, you know, fairly good guitar player. And he's like, oh, music theory sucks. This is bullshit. You know, and I was a drummer. So I was like, you know, rocking out, playing punk rock and stuff. 
And I was like, I don't need this. This is bullshit. You know, I know how to play drums. And I, but I could read, I could read charts. I could read drum charts, yeah. taking drum lessons and stuff like that. But the harmony and, and melody and, and just the, the technical know-how and the, the, the things that that lead to in engineering and mixing and producing are invaluable. I mean, I've gotten to age 43 and, and su making successful records without that. So there's, there's an element that says, well, you don't really need it. Rick Rubin has none of that. And other major producers I've worked with can don't even, can't string through three chords together either, and they've done done like massive records and made millions of dollars. But it's indispensable, you know. It's the greatest thing to have. Uh, it's the greatest piece of knowledge to have because that informs frequency uh, choices in, e in equalizing. It informs musical compression. It informs uh, balancing of harmonies and things like that. And I've learned it again despite that handicap. Uh, but I'm now taking that into my hands and I'm remedying that problem. It's a, it's a form of language. It's a language. We, that we didn't think we needed before, yeah. but once you start to do enough records, you realize that one of the biggest challenges in the studio is just communicating yes. clearly and quickly, yes. you know, through a mic, through a talkback mic to somebody yeah. else to make something yeah. the right and to, thing And to happen. express an idea concisely and with as few words as possible. And thank God for the Nashville number system, because when I learned that, you know, eight years ago or something, it changed my life. In the it, studio, it really is the the first experiences or the ones I even have now where I'm producing and I'm and there's a chart and I'm able to talk about where we are in the song and go back because otherwise it was all in my head and I was just yes. like the, remember there was that fill early on in the song that sounded so cool when everything was like all funky junky and people would be like what, what? <laughs> yeah exactly and and trying to explain that it's like trying to speak English to a guy who only speaks Swahili you're never gonna get there it's two completely different languages. And it, you, you may get there by pointing and, and, you know, showing and leading, but why do that when you can learn the language? It's, you're in the studio. And it's funny because my piano teacher will show me something. I'm like, oh my God, you know, that, you know, that thing is, is on that song, you know, or whatever. Like I'll, I'll reference that, um, like she was showing me some thing and I'm like, that's in that Eddie Moneyholt song, Baby Hold On. And she's like, oh yeah, that's exactly it. And I'm like, she's like, you know this shit. You just don't know what it's called. I'm like, I know. You know, um, did you find a good piano teacher here in Nashville? Yeah, she's give amazing. A shout out to? Allie Ferris. She is awesome. She's a piano tutor, piano teacher, singer, songwriter. She is a wonderful human being, super talented. And uh, yeah, I, I absolutely good. adore her. And I'm actually leaving here to go take my piano lessons. Sweet, man. Well, we'll let you go. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us, Ryan. Thanks for having me. This is I, awesome. I look forward to meeting your dad, too. Oh, yeah. And um, let the Rockstars know how they can find you online if they want to learn more about you, your music, follow you. Oh yeah, I'm on I'm on Twitter. I think it's Ryan Hewitt Mix and Instagram and Facebook. It's Ryan Hewitt in the studio. Uh, and my website is ryanhewitt.com. All right, dig it. Um, we'll see you more around the studio. I look forward to coming and checking out your place over there in uh, um, at the House of Blues. Absolutely, come by anytime. All right, man. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for coming, dude. Cheers. Thanks for having me. It was awesome. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.